Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. The Apache are among the most incredible, elusive, and deadly Native American tribes to have lived inside North America. Throughout 2023, I have released nine videos detailing just how incredible this Indian tribe was. Their history is full of triumph and disaster, but it's really just a series of incredible stories I feel privileged to have gotten to tell you. What follows is a compilation video of the stories I've released over the course of the last year about the Apache. They don't appear in the order that they were released. I put them as best I could in chronological order, although it was hard to do because a lot of the stories do overlap. In the video description, I have labeled where each episode begins, so that you are free to jump around to whichever topics most interest you. If you've enjoyed the videos, please leave a like and subscribe to the channel. It really does help. Additionally, if you have any questions about the Apache, please leave them in the comments. Or, if you have any suggestions for future videos, leave them there too. I thank you for watching, and enjoy the Apache series marathon. Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. The conflict between the Apache and Comanche is among the most long-lasting and brutal in all of Native American history. Sworn enemies, they fought each other in what the Spanish in Mexico called a war of extermination. By the late 1500s, the Eastern Apache had established a dominant presence in the southern region of the Great Plains. The area secured for them good buffalo hunting grounds, while also giving them space to practice agriculture. It was the best of both worlds. A semi-agrarian lifestyle diversified their diets and right next to the most valuable food source in all of North America. The Comanche, at the same time, were outcasts. Forced to unfavorable territory by more powerful groups like the Apache, their culture became aggressive and vengeful. But in the middle of the 1600s, one big change caused by their greatest enemy will lead them to becoming the most powerful native group in American history. In the 1500s, Spanish success in Mexico led to a continued desire to conquer. It was kind of their thing. The Europeans gradually moved north and had continued to colonize and spread their influence until they reached Apache territory. Spanish conquest was a directive. They brought with them metal armor, guns, and hundreds of horses as they spread into the territory of modern New Mexico around 1600. With overwhelming power, they quickly subjugated many native groups within the region. They forced them to take on Christianity and work for them as payment, just as they had done in Central and South America for the previous hundred years. However, the nearby Apache were less agreeable. The Apache violently raided these new Spanish settlements, stealing horses in the process. As they watched the Spanish from a distance, they learned how to ride them. By the 1650s, the Apache were conducting mounted raids on horseback. The added speed of the horse made them even more dangerous and effective. The constant harassment was more than the Spanish in the region could take. Spanish settlements like Taos and Santa Fe were frequent targets, and the Pueblo Indians the Spanish had conquered were the unfortunate victims of Apache terror. As Spanish subjects, the Pueblo expected protection, but the Spanish could not effectively provide them with any. The raids would be over quickly, but they were devastating. The Apache would kill anyone who opposed them and then disappear into the western landscape with hundreds of horses and other supplies. By 1680, the Apache raids became such a problem that the Pueblo had given up on Spanish protection and they revolted. They drove the Spanish out of New Mexico, but in the process, thousands of Spanish horses escaped. Mustangs, a horse well suited to live in the Great Plains, a horse that will find its way north. Here we fast forward a few decades. As territory had been lost and regained, the Spanish continued to be constantly raided by the Apache. But Apache behavior changed in 1706. Almost at once, the Spanish began to notice that the raids against them had stopped. Reports start to come in that the Spanish can't explain. The Apache are acting strangely. Bands like the Jai Carilla and the Mescaleros are seemingly leaving the plains, abandoning their settlements and farms, and doing so in a hurry. The Spanish heard rumors of great battles, but had no idea who the Apache were fighting. They were told of invaders from the north, mounted on horseback, that they were powerful, fast, and dangerous. By the 1720s, the Apache were so devastated that many bands had moved entirely into the mountains, or even coming to the Spanish for protection. Some bands didn't make it that far. Spanish expeditions found that plains-dwelling Apache bands like the Farones, Carlanes, and Palomas vanished entirely. 
exterminated by an enemy the Spanish couldn't even identify. So what was killing the Apache? The answer came from the Utes. They called the northern phantom invaders the Comancia. In their language, it meant those who are against me all the time. An appropriate meaning for people the Spanish would come to call the Comanche. The Apache created their own undoing from the Comanche. Historically, the Comanche are commonly described as rather unimpressive. They were bullied by the other tribes in the region, including the Apache. The Comanches were pushed to the eastern side of the Rockies to scratch out a living in the least desirable territory. In their rise to power, that is something that they will not forget. Then, in the middle of the 17th century, like a gift from the gods, they found the horse. The same horses that were freed as a result of Apache harassment of the Pueblo in Spanish. It changed everything for them. The horses were Mustangs. They were a breed suited for the plains in every way. Tough and rugged, in the two decades that followed the Spanish retreat from New Mexico, the horse had spread like wildfire. It's called the Great Horse Dispersal. All the tribes of the region started using them, but the Comanche did it better. The first thing they did differently was learn to breed horses. Other tribes didn't bother. They got their horses in raids. Not the Comanche. They bred their own. On the plains, horses were currency, and the Comanche were rich. The Eastern Apache, like many plains groups, were at least semi-agricultural. This tied them to land. The Comanche didn't farm at all. As full nomads, they could be anywhere on the plains, and horses gave them the ability to cover ranges previously thought impossible. If you were within 400 miles of the Comanche, you were in danger. As buffalo hunters, this range was incredibly valuable, but as warriors, it made them terrifying. Most raids would come in spring and summer, when the grass in the plains was high enough that the Comanche were sure they had enough food for their horses. They would often move at night. The light of the full moon would illuminate the plains, offering them visibility to both attack and escape. The raids were brutal. Murders, tortures, and acts I am reluctant to bring up on YouTube. This was so common that settlers would refer to these conditions as the Comanche moon. But their greatest advantage, what made them more effective than everyone else, was that they fought fully mounted. Almost no other tribe did this. George Catlin, the artist for this image, witnessed the Comanche firsthand. He describes what he saw. Quote, On their feet, they are one of the most unattractive and slovenly looking races of Indians I've ever seen. But the moment they mount their horses, they seem at once metamorphosized. I am ready, without hesitation, to pronounce the Comanches the most extraordinary horsemen I've seen yet in all my travels. End quote. They learned to fire a bow perfectly while riding at both enemy or buffalo. They would shield their bodies from their enemies by hanging off the sides of the animals while simultaneously shooting under the neck with deadly accuracy. The Apache used the horse to aid travel, but would dismount to fight. On foot, they were a match for anyone, and they were just as brutal as the Comanche. If they could catch the Comanche without their mounts, they may have even had an advantage at times. But the Comanche lived on the horse. Finding them was even impossible because on the warpath they never slept in the same place twice. It wasn't that way with the Apache. Their agriculture made them predictable and their fighting style was outdated. Author T.R. Fahrenbach said it best in his book, Comanches, A History of a People. Quote, it was this very taste for corn that killed them when their land was invaded by true savages on horseback. End quote. If the Apache were a terror to the Spanish, the Comanche were worse to the Apache. But their true mission wasn't to exterminate them. They were after resources, most importantly the range of the buffalo. I mentioned before, the Comanche remembered how they were treated when they were weak. It made them vengeful and very aggressive toward their enemies. In the book Lightpan Apaches by Thomas Britton, it's written, quote, The purpose of the Comanches was always the same to catch the Apache off guard of the rancherias, to make a sudden assault, kill as many Apaches as they could, capture some women and children for the slave trade in New Mexico, and plunder the rancherias and destroy the huts and crops." End quote. The war between these two great powers, lasting decades, has mostly been lost to history. Even the Spanish only witnessed it at a distance. But we do know it was brutal enough that all Comanches everywhere became foes of all Apaches. The results that were recorded are what tell us the story. 
The light pan were among the last Apache remaining on the plains. By the 1720s, the Mescaleros and Jicarillas had already retreated. In 1723, a mysterious conflict occurred. It's called El Gran Sierra del Ferrero. From what we can tell, a massive attack by Comanche against the Lipan lasted several days. It ended with many dead Lipan warriors, but the Comanche also captured huge numbers of women and children. Like the other bands, the Lipan were forced to retreat to the mountains and deserts, stuck as skulkers in the Spanish borderlands, with an overpowering force to the north in the Comanche and a sworn enemy to their south in the Spanish. For the Apache, it was time for a new strategy. In 1749, something weird happened. The Apache rode into San Antonio looking to make a peace treaty with the Spanish. The Spanish were thrilled because since the city was founded in 1719, the Apache had been constantly raiding them, and not on a small scale. Kidnappings and murders were common. The Apache made off with thousands of horses and countless supplies in that time. It was a serious problem and a major relief to the Spanish when the Apache asked for peace. The uptick in raids coincided with the Comanche kicking them out of their territory. The plains offered them more in food and resources than the mountains and deserts that they had been forced to. The Apache didn't only ask for peace. They also wanted the Spanish to build a mission and presidio in their territory so that they could convert to Christianity. This is something that they had been previously reluctant to do. The Spanish priests leaped at the opportunity. It took a couple years to approve, but doing this would solve several issues for the Spanish. They could put a stop to Apache raids, maybe for good, and they could also make them Catholic, saving their souls. There were rumors of gold and silver deposits in the area, but I am sure that that was entirely unrelated to their decision. Locations for the mission were scouted, and it was decided that they would build the mission and Presidio at a location called San Saba. Funding was secured by a rich Spaniard. All he wanted in return for footing the bill was that his brother, Father Alonso Geraldo de Terreros, run the mission. A competent and experienced Spanish officer, Don Diego Ortiz de Perilla, would overlook the project. In April 1757, the Spanish gathered their supplies, a few priests, a hundred soldiers, and about 2,000 animals for the project. But strangely, once they got on the way, the Apache were absent. When the party arrived at San Saba, the Apache were also nowhere to be found. Regardless, the mission and Presidio were built about two miles apart from each other, and both were protected by a large wooden palisade. Occasionally, the Apache would visit the mission. They would ask for gifts and promise to relocate there soon. But after months of them not doing that, the Spanish were becoming increasingly frustrated. Some of the priests felt this whole thing was just a trick, and that the Apache really only wanted gifts. This whole thing was a trick, but not for gifts. In March, the Spanish learned the real reason the Apache had led them there. San Saba was not part of Apacheria. It was Comanche territory, and the Apache were trying to start a fight. As it turns out, the Apache had been going north to conduct raids against the Comanche. While the Apache were north, they would spread rumors of the fort built in San Saba. To provoke the Comanche even more, following the raids, the Apache would leave things like Spanish tools and shoes in their camps, leading them to believe the Spanish were allied with the Apache. In early March 1758, the spring grasses were beginning to grow, and recent clear nights had left the full moon to brighten the plains. The Spanish noted that all the Apache around San Saba had disappeared completely. As the sun rose, they began to hear war whoops from beyond their walls. Over 60 of their horses were missing. 15 soldiers sent out for reconnaissance returned in a hurry, claiming the hills were alive with enemies. For nearly the next two weeks, the Comanche took their time, staying at a distance. The Presidio locked down. Most refused to leave the walls. Father Terreros, as well as about 30 others, stayed in the mission, two miles away from the Presidio. On March 16th, the Comanche showed up at the gates of both. As the Spanish looked over the walls of their palisade, they were struck with awe with what they saw. Fehrenbach writes, quote, The savages were a breathtaking, barbaric spectacle. Plains Amerindians in the full panoply of war. The long lines of riders wore fantastic headdresses of plumes, deer antlers, and bison horns. Their face were painted red and black, the color of death. Every warrior carried a bow and lance or spear. The soldiers noticed that at least a few hundred had new muskets." End quote. 
At the mission, the Comanche first feigned friendship, and the priests just let them in. The Comanche were accompanied by several other native tribes the Spanish had previously worked with peacefully. Once inside the gates, the Spanish tried to appease them with gifts, but it didn't take long to turn into a slaughter. I have seen differing figures, but the Comanche killed between 8 and 10 in the mission, including Father Toreros. They set fire to the buildings and mutilated the bodies of the dead. As they were looting goods, a number were able to escape to the better defended Presidio. Likely, the Comanche prioritized looting over fleeing missionaries who were no threat to them. Perilla tried to reinforce the mission, but the soldiers he sent were immediately attacked and forced to retreat. The Comanche never even attacked the Presidio. They wouldn't. They were smart. They had the advantage against the mission, and they had made their point. Two days later, just as quickly as they appeared, they were gone. The immediate aftermath of the San Saba massacre gets worse for the Spanish. The next year, in 1759, they sent out a punitive expedition. The point was retaliation against the Comanche. It was led by Perilla. It didn't go great. The Spanish traveled north and killed a bunch of Tonkawa for no reason other than that they were there. They later encountered the Comanche at the Red River in October, but the Comanche were prepared. There was no going into their land without them knowing you were coming and there was no finding them without them letting you. Their force was overwhelming. The Spanish had around a thousand people. The Comanche had at least twice that. It horrified the Spanish, but at least they were initially somewhat organized. The 130 Apache with them and the other Indian auxiliaries knew full well what the Comanche were capable of and were not looking for a fight like this. Perilla tried to keep the expedition together, but many fled just as the battle started. It led to a panic and full retreat without almost any fighting having occurred. They even left their materials, including cannons behind. What was intended to be a show of force turned into a massive humiliation. The Apache plan to create a buffer of Spanish against the Comanche had failed, miserably. It appeared the Spanish couldn't stand up to them either, but it's going to get worse for the Apache. Within a few years, the Comanche had moved far enough south that they were regularly raiding the Spanish borderlands. Spanish settlements were spread out over arid country. It was like highway for the Comanche. It was easy for them to avoid forts, which were the only real threat that they perceived. The brutality of the time is captured by S.C. Gwen in the book Empire of the Summer Moon. Quote, they never attacked an armed fort. They relished surprise, insisted on tactical advantage. They would attack whole villages and burn them, torturing and killing their inhabitants, leaving young women with their entrails carved out. Men burned alive. They skewered infants and took young boys and girls as captives. Then they used the speed of the Spanish Mustangs to get away, leaving the elaborately equipped dragoons to rumble ponderously after them." End quote. Any attempt for the Spanish to retaliate was generally met with disappointment. The Spanish, like the Apache, struggled even find the Comanche. Occasionally, punitive expeditions would be sent after the Comanche anyway. Some would come back empty-handed. Some wouldn't come back at all. Whether victims of the Comanche or the Harsh Plains geography, history will never truly know. Now it was the Spanish who needed a new strategy, and the Apache will force them into one. Since the San Saba disaster, the Apache had resumed their raids on the Spanish too. It wasn't all malice. Having been driven completely from the plains by the Comanche, they were unable to farm and required more things. In 1780, the Texas governor, Domingo Cabello, wrote from San Antonio, quote, There is no instant, day or night, when the reports of barbarities and disorders do not arrive from the ranches. Totally unprotected as we are, this can only result in the complete destruction and loss of this province. End quote. The Spanish started to consider something they never had before a war of extermination. They were being attacked by two great powers simultaneously, but those powers hated each other. The Spanish hoped to leverage that. Up until almost 1780, the Spanish had mostly failed at even communicating with the Comanche. But that all changed when an officer named Don Juan Batista de Anza was able to earn some respect. He led an expedition into Comancheria. Using familiar mounted tactics as the Comanche, he was able to destroy a band they caught off guard near Greenhorn Peak. There was definitely some hubris involved on the part of the Comanche. They were not impressed with the Spanish fighting ability up until this point, and it seems they did not take them as seriously as they should have. 
Anza followed up his success with more attacks in subsequent years. After his attacks, he would release those that he had captured with a message. The Comanche could have peace and trade whenever they wanted it. By 1785, the Comanche losses were not great, but serious enough that they were ready to meet. Several bands sent representatives to a meeting in Taos, and in a work of magic by Anza, he got them agreed to let one person speak for them. At the end of the meeting, they agreed to three things. One, the Comanche would stop attacking the Spanish. Two, trade would open up between the Spanish and the Comanche. And three, the Comanche would help the Spanish destroy the Apache. This was a massive victory for the Spanish. Not only do hostilities stop against the Comanche, but their oldest enemy in the region would be hunted down and destroyed band by band, something that the Comanche were happy to agree to. The best example of these Spanish Comanche campaigns comes from January 1790. A Spanish general, Juan de Ugaldi, led a powerful horde of Spanish Comanche and Wichitas against the Lipan Apache. Hundreds of warriors were trapped at a canyon west of San Antonio and slaughtered. After their defeat, the Lipan Apache were left with less than a thousand warriors in total. The tribe, like the rest of the Apache bands, abandoned whatever land they had left on the fringes of Comancheria and retreated entirely into the mountains, again for good. As the most powerful tribe in North America, the Comanche had completed their claim for the plains. And the Spanish, for a time, no longer had to consider the Apache a serious threat to their settlements. And the peace between the Spanish and Comanche held for decades. But the Apache are resilient. On the plains, the Comanches were victorious. But the rugged nature of the mountains made the horses less of an advantage there. And in that environment, the Apache could resist successfully. In that they did. Both the American civilizations of the Spanish and the Comanche would fall before them. But those are stories for another day. Welcome Dates and Dead Guys. Today our story is about what it would be like to be captured by and live among the Apache. Specifically, we are going to follow Herman Lehman. After his capture, at just 11 years old in 1870, he will forget all about his old world, as over the course of nine years, he has to fight for survival in his place among the Indians. But before we get started, I research historical topics I find interesting and explain them in a way I would to my friends. If that is your kind of thing, please subscribe and leave a like on the video. If you really like it, share it. It supports me and it will help grow the channel. But let's get to our story. It's May. 1870. Herman's mother sends him, his brother Willie, and his sister Caroline into their family's wheat field to scare away the birds. After a job well done, the kids sat down in the field to play. By the time they saw them, they were already surrounded. Herman later recalled, quote, When we saw their hideous painted faces, we were terribly frightened, and some of us pulled for the house. Willie was caught right where he was sitting. Caroline ran toward the house. The Indians shot at her several times, and she fell. They chased me for a distance and caught me. I yelled and fought manfully when the chief, Conaviste, laid hold upon me, and a real scrap was pulled off right there. The Indians slapped me, choked me, beat me, tore my clothes off. I thought he was going to kill me." End quote. The Apaches stripped both boys naked and threw them on the backs of their horses. The boys were cut up as the raiding party stampeded through briars, thorns, and cat claws and the endless ride left him sunburned. Thinking back to the time, Herman wrote, quote, death just then would have been a relief to me, end quote. This is a dangerous world, and not that long ago. In 1870, the Apache and Comanche still roamed the plains. Murders and kidnappings of settlers on the frontier were still a regular occurrence. His story comes down to us through a book, Nine Years Among the Indians, in which Herman Lehman himself tells his story of survival decades later. After they were captured, Herman and Willie were painted and dressed as Apache and then separated. Willie's group ran into a group of Texas Rangers. While the Rangers pursued the group, the horse Willie was on was weakening, and the Apache, riding with him, threw him off to lighten the load and escape. The Rangers either didn't see Willie, or they thought he was an Indian child because he was dressed like one. Either way, he was left on his own, 
at just eight or nine years old, he was able to make his way to a road, and after failing to wave down a few travelers, he eventually was able to hitch a ride to a nearby town and make his way home. Herman was not so lucky. He was forced to eat raw meat, which made him vomit regularly. This displeased the chief, Carnaviste, and he was regularly beaten. To keep him from running away, the Apache tell him his family is dead, all killed in the raid. They also tie him to stakes, face down, with his arms stretched out, and they put a large stone on his back to keep him from moving as they sleep. Herman was afraid, tortured, and he believed everyone he loved was dead. Night after night, they traveled in the same manner, for weeks. Sometimes they would go days without food. Herman became more accustomed to raw meat, and over time it seemed the Apache were kinder to him, until they reached the village. There, in a frightening scene where guns are firing and people are shouting and dancing all around, Herman is grabbed. The Apache forcefully pierce his ears with hot irons, cut his hair, and beat him until he passes out. When Herman woke the next day, he had been bathed and oiled. Confused, he looked around. He saw an Apache, and he was taken to a feast on the ground where a blanket had been spread. In front of him was sun-baked bread, roasted meat, and raw meat. As he sat there, the Apache just stared at him. He had to make a choice. Herman writes, quote, Either on account of my extreme hunger or divine providence, I seized the raw meat and began to eat. That pleased the Indians, and they immediately began to pat me. Had I first touched the cooked food, the bread, the palancia, and the roasted meat, the food of civilized man, I would likely have been tortured to death. End quote. The Apache were elated. They cheered and made it clear Herman had pleased them. They even gave Herman an Apache name, Enda, meaning white boy. It wasn't a clever name, but Herman was happy to have not been killed. He became a servant to Carnaviste, fetching water, lighting his pipe, and taking care of his daily needs. He was also forced to wrestle with Apache boys. Herman was scrappy, and the Apache liked that about him. Herman was growing more accepted by the Apache, but he still lived in terror. At one point, he was entrusted to watch over a small herd of horses. At his lowest moment, alone, he would just sit there in a prairie and cry. He wrote about what he was feeling. Quote, Civilized people call it homesickness. I would sit there on my pony and cry. I never cried while I was being tortured, nor when I ran the gauntlet, nor when I nearly drowned. In all those times, I gave a yell of defiance or a snarl of vengeance, but now, in my loneliness and desolation, I could weep. A new thought struck me, and my tears vanished. A smile flitted over my face. I made up my mind to escape." End quote. Herman grabbed a water bag and took off on the horse allotted to him. He headed east at a gallop. It didn't take long for the tribe to notice. They'd been expecting this. It was a test. He had a head start, but his horse tripped and he was overtaken by his pursuers. He was tied and dragged back to camp. The tribe held counsel, but, again, they decided not to kill him. They forced him to sleep tied up for a while, but during the day they assigned boys to him to keep him company. He starts to feel less lonely. Over time, he learned the language, and Carnavisti's wife, Laughing Eyes, lavished him with affection. She had no son of her own, and as an 11-year-old boy, Herman welcomed the motherly tenderness. The Apache began to teach him valuable skills, like how to make a bow and arrows and maybe most importantly, how to make a shield out of buffalo skin. Part of this may have just been to shoot at him, which they do to check to see if the shield works. After a while, they start taking him on raids. At first, he is just fodder. The Apache come across a the horse they want to steal, but are not sure where the ranchers are? Send Herman. He's expendable. But when he kept on being successful, he started to gain some respect. While with a war party, Herman and a group of Apache come across four Mexican buffalo hunters on foot. They charged after them. A few made their way toward cover, but one panicked and fled out in the open. The Apache captured him. In Spanish, he tells the Apache where his camp is and that it's empty. Going for supplies, the Apache left the Mexican with Herman to watch. As the war party approached the camp, men inside opened fire. It was a trap. Upon hearing gunshots, the captured Mexican begins throwing rocks at 11-year-old Herman. Herman fired his arrow at him, hitting him in the arm, and the man surrenders. Seeing that the camp is a bit more defended than they had been led to believe, the Apache retreated back to where Herman was keeping the Mexican. He tells Carnaviste about the Mexican throwing rocks at him, and he goes into a rage and orders Herman to kill him. Herman raised his bow and sent an arrow through the man's heart. 
It's the first person he ever killed. Not satisfied, Colonel Viste orders Herman to take the man's scalp, fearing punishment. He does that too. For the Apache, he was one of them now. And for Herman, there was no turning back. As Herman was sinking into his new life among the Apache, the world was changing around him. He was captured in 1870, at the height of the Indian Wars in the West. With each passing season, the Americans gained a stronger foothold and established their presence more and more. It wasn't uncommon for the Apache to go to reservations, even for a short time as they would be forced there by the Americans. The growing pressure seemed constant, as they were consistently working to avoid rangers, soldiers, and the Mexican rurales. The condensed space led to common tension between the Apache and the Comanche. Battles were common, but so were treaties for peace. Gambling was actually a common solution. Herman would race Comanche boys on horseback or be forced to wrestle them. These would be starting points for negotiation between groups. Even rival Apache bands would fight each other over resources and territory. And as these larger forces played themselves out, one small thing will play a constant role in the background. Although the Apache had told him different, Herman's family was alive. When he saw his sister fall in the field, she was only playing dead. And as they rode off with Willie and Herman, they were never able to kill his family. For the entire time Herman was gone, his mother would never stop looking for him, checking every fort and reservation for word on a white boy among the Indians. But let's get back to Herman. After three years with the Apache, Herman was one of them. He feared and hated white people. He hardly remembered his old life and had forgotten his old name and native language. During those years, he had chances to escape, but that wasn't what he wanted anymore. He wanted to be a respected member of the tribe, and an incident with Texas Rangers will give him an opportunity to earn that. When Herman was 14, he was with a small party of Apache that were caught off guard by Texas Rangers. Herman fled along with some others, but his horse was shot, and when it fell, it landed on top of him. He pleaded for his friends to help him, but seeing he was trapped, they took his bow and ran off without him. Herman thought the rangers would kill him, but when they ran up to him, they noticed he was white. Seeing him trapped, the rangers agreed to go after the fleeing Apache and come back for Herman. The rangers made it only a couple hundred yards before returning to the spot where Herman was trapped under the horse. But he was gone. Vanished. One of the rangers, Thomas P. Gillespie, related the story years later to a magazine. He wrote of Herman's escape. Quote, at this, they were puzzled beyond expression. The scene of the fight and the chase was an open plain with nothing to obstruct the view for miles. And from the moment the horse was killed until their return to the spot, they had been in full view of the surroundings and the boy could not have gotten away without their having seen him make the start. There were a few scattering mesquites, but none large enough to offer concealment. The grass was green and seven or eight inches high and into this he must have crawled and secreted himself. The search began, and in a short time, the entire company came up and all joined in the hunt. Every square rod for a mile around was gone over, and every bush and tuft of grass was examined. But the boy was nowhere to be found, and we gave up the search as hopeless, and went away completely mystified as to what had become of him." End quote. The Apache may be the most elusive group to have ever lived. And in three years, Herman had mastered the skill. Herman had managed to drag himself out from under the horse staying low to the ground. He crawled until he found a depression in the field, concealed himself with grass, and stayed hidden until they left. With his group of Apaches having fled, Herman is all alone, with no supplies and no horse. He traveled 300 miles by himself to make it back to his tribe. I know I said this before, but he is only 14 years old. When he makes it back, he is looked at by his tribe like a ghost. His comrades had told a story to his tribe that Herman had been killed and that they had buried him. Seeing that they had lied and, in reality, abandoned him, Carnoviste instead made Herman a petty chief in the tribe. He had gained his respect. But all good things come to an end. In just a few short years, the amount of white encroachment on the territory was obvious. The presence of the American military made life very difficult for the Apache. They looked for new territory, some place they hoped the white people would never go. They found safer lands, but they were barren and didn't have enough food to support them. In one case, they found a perfect spot. There was plenty of water and game, but occasionally they would also find a strange yellow metal. Carnoviste wisely knew there was no long-term solution there. 
the Americans would come. At one point, the military was able to force the Apache to the Fort Sill Reservation. Oddly, a Comanche, the famous Quanah Parker, was the one who persuaded them to surrender to the military. They were there for a short time, but hating the treatment there, they attempt one last run for freedom. In the middle of the night, the Apache fled the reservation. Not nicely, they killed several soldiers on the way out, but they travel 100 miles west to make their final stand against the soldiers pursuing them, and they make short work of it. Quote, The Indians decoyed them off on a route where there was no water. We knew what the consequences would be. So at the spring, we filled up our water bags and pursued the soldiers. Soon, we began to find dead horses on the way. Then, we came upon a man nearly famished for water. He was stripped, scalped, and cut into pieces. We followed and found eight others, and they shared the same fate as the first mentioned. These soldiers passed close to the water, but it was in a deep hole, and the Indians kept it covered up. We saw, from the direction the other soldiers were traveling, that they would all perish on the dry sand. So we went back to the right trail of our people. We found them at the spring." End quote. Initially, the Apache thought that they were free, but the problem now was one they had faced before. They couldn't stay here. The land was uninhabitable. There wasn't enough water or game. The Apache the group had found there were already in a deplorable condition, half starving and cold. They stayed for a short time, but it was clear they would all die if they continued down this course. After holding counsel, the band decided to return to Fort Sill, a choice that will spell their doom. One nice thing about reservation was that getting whiskey was pretty easy. One bad thing was that getting whiskey was pretty easy. The bands that exist here, although they are mostly Apache, don't all get along. Tribes are not just one people. They are groups with a similar language and culture, and sometimes they fight. One group in particular fought with Herman's band a lot. They would torment them, especially one of the medicine men. One night, the rival band came to visit our group after a big party. Herman calls it a carousel. They demanded to be given whiskey, and a fight breaks out between the two groups. One of our Apache was wounded. Honor demands the blood be repaid, so our group goes to the rival camp and steals their beer. Another larger fight breaks out, and it has to be broken up by the soldiers. Now the authorities are involved, and Herman's group knows that punishment is coming. They don't want to deal with that, so they plan to run away again. But, before they do, another shipment of whiskey comes in. Staying one more night couldn't hurt anybody. Right? That carousel was the worst I have ever witnessed. Herman describes a scene of drunken madness. Women literally fighting each other over infidelity result in the death of several of them. In a riled up state, the men attack the rival band before packing up all the materials their horses can carry and booking it off reservation for the plains region. A day later, the rival band catches up to them. They fend off the attackers and as they retreat, our Apache pursue them. But the attack was a ruse. They were run right into an ambush. Quote, Indians seemed to rise up out of the ground and fired us. All of our comrades were killed. We turned and retreated slowly, a kind of running fight, to within a quarter mile of camp. Two or three came up with us, and we had a hand-to-hand -hand combat. Lances, spears, and tomahawks flew lively for a while, but I was too busy to take much notice of what was going on around me." End quote. In the middle of the battle, Carnaviste steps in to stop a warrior attacking Herman with a spear. In the process, he is run through himself by the rival band's medicine man. At this, Herman is left to face off against the man alone. Herman already feared this man, and he was always told medicine men couldn't be killed. Quote, When Carnaviste fell, this medicine man came toward me with a Winchester, and waving his shield, he said to me, This is your last day, for now you die. I ran behind a big rock and replied, You are me. End quote. Seeing the medicine man go after Herman, the remaining Apache, having dispatched the rest of the enemy, head for the camp. Herman is just 15 years old. They were confident their medicine man would be able to win and rejoin them in a moment. Herman was armed with a bow, so we have an awkward situation where both are circling a big rock trying to get off a shot. Rounds from the Winchester are ricocheting off the rocks, just missing Herman. Then, after circling the rock three or four times, Herman is able to get a shot off with his bow. It hits home, right under the shield of the medicine man. He lay on the ground bleeding, begging for mercy. Herman put one more arrow in his heart. Herman grabbed his gun and all of his ammo before running off to hide. Killing a medicine man was a big deal. The rival Apache would be after him. 
Herman sat on a mountaintop thinking. For hours after the body of the medicine man was discovered, the rival Apache searched for him. All of the men in his band were dead, and there was no joining another. They would know he had killed the medicine man. One of them would come for him no matter what band he joined. He would never be safe with the Apache again. So he made a decision. After the search party had left, he snuck back into camp, gathered all the supplies he could carry, and managed to steal the fastest horse they had, a beautiful gray stallion. With nowhere to go, Herman rides off to survive in the wilderness alone. With everyone in his band killed, the rest of the Apache wanting him dead and fearing the white people, Herman had no real viable options. He traveled for many days before finding a narrow canyon with a stream and cottonwood trees. There was game, and he was able to use a cavern in the canyon walls as a shelter. He stayed there for eight months, all alone, except for his horse. You can't stay like this forever. Eventually, he got his push. One night, during a full moon, he's in his shelter, and as he's trying to sleep, he keeps hearing voices. He thinks that it's just his mind playing tricks on himself. They are faint. But then he hears a loud laugh, and his heart drops. Herman creeps out of his cave, and a few hundred yards down the canyon, he sees a fire, and in it human shapes are moving around in the darkness. Using rocks for cover, he makes his way closer to investigate. They are Apache, and he knows each and every one of them. They know he killed the medicine man, and if they find him, they will kill him. Herman quietly gathered as much as he could pack on his horse, and then he rode away, this time riding north into the range of the buffalo. Comanche territory. It was time to take his chances with them. At this point in the story, Herman is still only around 15 years old, and like many 15 year olds, he doesn't have a great plan. He intends to find a Comanche village, ask them if he can join their tribe, and hopefully not get murdered. The Comanche often like to murder trespassers, and they are very good at it, so there is some risk. Oh, and he doesn't speak the language. He intends to use hand gestures and expression to get his point across, and just hope someone there knows ASL. Or, I guess, NASL. No one is going to get that joke. Herman has no idea how, or when he is going to find the Comanche, but one creepy night lets him know that he is getting close. Quote, One night I could hear wild animals running, and the scream of something like a panther. But I did not think it was that kind of animal. It didn't sound right. Then the wolves began to hound and they did not sound exactly right. I was pretty sure Indians were near, but the imitations were not of my tribe. I lay perfectly still, listening. Rattlesnakes seemed more numerous than usual, and I could hear them rattling all around. The whole animal world seemed to be disturbed. I silently secured my horse, threw on my equipment, and stole away in the darkness. Next morning, I saw many Indian signs. I must have been close to a large party." End quote. I don't blame him for not wanting to meet the Comanche that way, but his way wasn't much better. Now that he knows they're in the area, it doesn't take him long to track them. He stalks them for a while, and one night he sneaks into their camp. He sees a group of warriors seated around a campfire telling stories, laughing and joking. He watches them, and he notes how little laughter there was among the Apache. He musters up all of his courage and just walks in among them. Not expecting a visitor, it takes the Comanche a moment to realize what has happened. Then seemingly, all at once, the warriors jump up to their feet, let out a war whoop, and run away. Herman just stands there in the firelight like an idiot. He writes, quote, I must have been a vicious looking Indian. Long dangling hair, uncouth and unkept. There I stood, wondering if they would come back and try to kill me. End quote. In a short time, they do come back, charging and yelling. Unable to speak the language, Herman tries to make signs that he's peaceful. He is sure they are going to kill him. One fierce old woman breaks in front of the men, gesturing for them to do so. But before they do, another Comanche comes forward. He speaks some Apache, and they are able to communicate. Herman tells them his story, about how he was born white and became an Apache, that he loves the Indian and hates the white man, that his tribe was killed, and that the Apache had forsaken him, and that now he wanted to become a Comanche. Amazingly, one of the Comanche remembered him. Herman had beaten him years earlier in one of the horse races Carnaviste used to make him do. The Comanche welcomed him to stay the night. It was his first night with people in as much as a year. Over the next few days, Herman travels with the Comanche before they reach the main body of the tribe, 
Herman makes his case to the chief to become one of them. The chief made Herman promise to perform all the duties of a Comanche warrior, protect the tribe, and obey the chief in all things in both peace and war. He was even given a Comanche name, Montachina. And for a while, things were good. Herman went on raids with the Comanche. He battled the Tonkawa and the American soldiers as he swore he would do. But the same issue that plagued the Apache was true for the Comanche. The American juggernaut was encroaching. Again, Kwana Parker was a voice of reason. The options were to starve as the Americans killed all the buffalo, or resign to reservation. After enough time, it was clear the Indian way of life was over, and they agreed to go. It was there that Herman would be reunited with his family, his white family. In his time with the Comanche, Herman developed a close relationship with many, but was literally adopted into the family of Quanah Parker. He treated him like a son while on reservation, and he lived with them for a couple years. It was notable that a white man was living among the Comanche on reservation, and word slowly got out. Amazingly, after nine years, Herman's mother never stopped looking for her son. She had intentionally found herself in the company of General Ronald S. McKenzie. He knew of a white boy at the Comanche reservation, and agreed to have him sent down to her. Herman, however, did not agree to be sent down. He was a Comanche through and through, and needed some convincing. Herman also believed his family was dead. It's what the Apache had told him. He didn't want to leave, but Quanah pressed him to do so. He promised that he could come back and live with him if it wasn't his family, but he believed life would be better for Herman there than relying on the government on the reservation. Escorted by soldiers, Herman made his way to Loyal Valley, Texas, where his family lived. He said that when he left the wagon, 300 people had gathered to greet him. They all spoke a language he didn't understand. They all looked at him. He recalled, quote, quite a crowd of people gathered around, and among them was my mother, but I didn't know her. The years of savagery which had passed over my head had erased from my memory, end quote. Neither Herman nor his family recognized each other. At first they had thought they made a mistake, but then his brother Willie and his sister Mina found a scar on his arm from where she had cut him with a hatchet when they were kids. As they examined it, Herman wrote what happened in his mind, quote, the dark curtain of oblivion, which had been drawn so long, was pulled back, and to me, there came a recollection of my early childhood. I was restored. I recognized my brother and sister, and remembered them as my playmates in a far distant past. Then somebody kept saying, Herman, Herman, and that name had a familiar sound. It then occurred to me that that was my own name. Slowly but surely, the mist began to clear away, and I knew I had found my people. But I was an Indian, and I did not like them because they were pale faces." End quote. It took months, maybe years, the timeline isn't clear in the text, but after a long time, Herman is able to rejoin his family. There were some quirks. Initially, he tried to escape a lot. His brother Willie had to stay around him and chase him down and bring him back. He also refused to sleep on a bed, preferring the ground. He got a kick out of dressing like a Comanche and doing war whoops and brandishing his bow at the neighborhood kids, but eventually the love of his family won him over. They broke through, and he was able to more or less move on with a normal life. But what of the Comanche? Well, that's kind of a fun way to end the story. When Herman was 17, two years before he was reunited with his family, Quanah Parker's family adopted him. Up until Herman Lehman's death, he was still considered and treated as a full member of their family visiting them frequently and treated that way accordingly. He was even enrolled as a full member of the Comanche tribe and received tribal benefits from the government. In the end, he rejoined his family, but he never lost the Comanches. Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. In 1863, a phrenologist in New York City named Orson Fowler was sent the skull of an Apache Indian. It was massive. A decade later, he published a book called The Human Science, or Phrenology, featuring a diagram of the skull with a caption about how in size it had no equal. Its other distinguishing characteristic is that it had a hole from a bullet entering in the back and coming out around the right eye. The Apache was murdered. After he had died, his body was examined. In life, the 70-year-old man measured six foot four, a giant among a people who averaged around five foot six in the 19th century. He was their chief, one who stood out not just because of his size. To the Apache, he was the bravest and wisest, also the most brutal to his enemies. History knows him as Mangus Coloradus, 
the greatest Apache war chief. In this episode, we are going to see how his life and shameless murder ensure that there could never be a lasting peace between the Americans and free Apache. Prior to the 1840s, Mangus Coloradus was known as Fuerte, a name meaning strong or stout, appropriate for a physical giant. He was born around 1790, but Fuerte likely came to power in his band of copper mine Apache before 1820. They are a subgroup of the Chiricahua and also go by other names. It was common for many Native American groups to have names for people as children and then as adults have a given name as well as other nicknames. Some point out physical characteristics, others a significant event. For Mangus Coloradus, or Fuerte, we see both examples. It wasn't typical for someone in their early 20s to become a chief, but Fuerte wasn't typical. He didn't just stick out because of his size. He grew up in a time of serious turmoil and showed obvious propensities for leadership and wisdom. Between the 1820s and early 1830s, the relationship between Mexico and the Apache began to disintegrate. As an independent country from Spain, they struggled to maintain the previous Presidio system that pacified the Apache of previous generations. The Mexicans would give the Apache rations and, in exchange, they wouldn't raid their villages and towns. That's easy enough. But financial trouble made the Mexican governments be more stingy, and cutbacks on the handouts led to predictable results. If the Mexicans couldn't fulfill their needs with rations as they had promised, the Apache would raid to take what they needed as they always historically did. The results would devastate the states of Sonora and Chihuahua. Dozens of raids began taking place year after year. They were violent, but they didn't always kill people. The goal was usually to gain resources, but casualties were high. As an odd aside, some historians claim that leaving people alive was part of the Apache strategy. They were harvesting from their victims and could raid and take from them again in the future. Mangus Coloradus would say as much, telling an American party in the 1850s, quote, if we kill off all the Mexicans, who will raise the cattle and horses for us, end quote. In a different video, mostly about Geronimo, I detailed the complex Apache relationship to Mexico. If you are interested in that, please check it out. I will link it in the description. But to get us to the next phase of the story, this is what we need to know. Mexico turned to mercenaries and scalp bounties in the 1830s to handle their Apache problem. Honor cultures, like the Apache, meet those types of actions with retaliation and escalating violence. The turning point was an event called the Johnson Massacre. An American, John Johnson, hired by Mexico, had feigned friendship with a group of Apache in 1837. He got the group drunk and, with a hidden swivel cannon and rifleman, killed around two dozen Apache. They were all scalped, including the chief that often worked with Mexican governments, named Juan Jose Campa. Fuerte was rumored to have been there, but escaped when the slaughter started. Raiding was a way of life for the Apache, but incidents like this were different. Deceit was not taken the same way as direct and intentional war parties. It led to some very intense hate. In the 1850s, Mangus Coloradus once told an American army captain, Enoch Steen, that the hatred between the Apache and Mexico was eternal, and that it was, quote, war to the knife, end quote. Meaning if the Apache had nothing left, they would still go to war with Mexico. Fuerte, as chief, had to make a choice on what his warriors would do next. His decision would earn him his new name. Shortly after the Johnson Massacre, Fuerte led several punitive war parties. In one incident around the Santa Rita copper mines, they killed 22 fur trappers. They followed that up by ambushing a wagon train, moving up to Santa Fe, and killed another 12. Imagine that scene for a moment. Dozens of Apache waiting to ambush a wagon train. They don't war whoop in the lead up to battle like the Comanche or Lakota. The Apache are quiet. When you see them, you know it's already too late. They are led from the front by a man who is a literal giant for his time. You have heard the rumors about what they do to the capture. Maybe you have even seen things. You know your death won't be quick. Two separate sources reported that the locals near the mines grew so terrified by the attacks that they fled for the Janos Presidio. But in their flight, the Apache killed them by the hundreds. It sounds like death on an impossible scale. And admittedly, some historians are skeptical. There is a lack of Mexican reports to verify it. But two things are true. Following the retribution for the Johnson Massacre, the Santa Rita copper mines were abandoned 
and the name Fuerte disappeared from the record books. It would be replaced by Mangus Coloratus, Red Sleeves, a name earned because of the blood covering him following the violence. Mangus Coloratus, from this time up until the rise of Cochise, his son-in-law, was the most powerful and respected Apache chief. Relations between the Apache and Mexicans did not improve over the next decade. Bloodshed was relentless on both sides, although it seems pretty clear that the Apache got the better of it. But in 1846 came a serious change. In 1846, Mexico went to war with the United States. We stole Texas, some people are still not over it. But for the Apache, the war was great news. When it appeared the Americans had no intention to inhabit their territory, they initially welcomed them with open arms, and their initial relationship to the Apache was great. There were some bumps. America's peace treaty with Mexico said that they were supposed to intervene to prevent Apache raids into their country. But that order was essentially unenforceable, and the Americans mostly ignored it. The Apache thought that was great. They would raid Mexico, and then return to New Mexico or Arizona, now American territory, where the Mexicans couldn't come get them. The real issue turned out to be gold. American miners had their eyes in the Pinos Altos Mountains in the Chiricahua homeland, Mangus' territory. It was a point of contention. Not because the miners wanted to travel through the territory, the Apache more or less let people through for the gold rush to California. The issue was in the Apache beliefs. They were permitted to pick up pieces of gold in the ground, but mining for it was an insult to Usen, their most prominent god. In January of 1852, there was a significant incident of violence where a small group of Apache were killed by Americans. The Apache retaliated by capturing and killing three other Americans a few days later, as they do. One poor soul was tortured to death and scalped. Scalping was not typical practice for the Chiricahua, but they liked his red hair. So there you go. Cooler minds prevailed, and Mangus Coloratus, as the most respected Apache chief, signed a peace treaty at Acoma with Colonel Edwin Sumner. Mangus Coloratus was the lone Apache who signed it because no other chief was willing to go. They felt it was likely a trap. This is a notable thing with Mangus Coloratus. He was in his 60s at this point, and as an elder, he was worried about the future of his people. He really wanted peace with the Americans to work and operated in good faith to make that happen. He even got the Americans to promise the Apache rations. He felt that would go a long way in preventing them from raiding. Even as a chief, he didn't have any legal authority over his people. They followed him because they respected him, so he worked very hard to put them in a good position. In exchange for rations, the Apache had to take up agriculture. It was not their strong suit, but they were making an effort. One last notable thing about the Treaty of Acoma was that Mangus Coloratus did not acknowledge giving up any lands. In his mind, Apacheria belonged to his people. That and good faith among the Americans were his lines in the sand. For the next decade, through the 1850s, things went more or less well between the Apache and the Americans. There was an incident in 1856 where the Coyotero Apache killed an Indian agent. The U.S. wanted Mangus' help in catching the Apache, but he was unsure if they were guilty. So when the Americans tried to approach, he had set a forest fire and helped the Coyotero escape into Mexico. The Americans didn't like that, or that a 65-year-old was still leading others into Mexico for war parties, or that the Apache were not being great farmers. They didn't grow much, and much of what they did grow was corn, and they made most of that into an alcohol called Tiswin. Not what the army had intended, but they continued to issue the Apache rations anyway. For Mangus Coloratus, it was really the miners that made the relationship go south. Around 1860, there were enough miners in the Pinos Altos Mountains that conflicts between the Apache and the miners were becoming more common. Violence was growing likely. But Mangus Coloratus took a different approach. Now about 70, he took up the habit of visiting the miners. He would tell them about the gold that existed just south in the mountains of Mexico. He even promised a bunch of them that he would show them where it was. But something went wrong. The miners felt the tension with the Apache, and they got the sense the old man was trying to lure them into a trap. It is not truly verified, but according to legend, on one of his visits, a group of miners seized him, and to teach him a lesson, they bound the old chief to a tree. They then lashed him with an ox whip until his back had deep cuts. This would have been humiliating for him. For the Apache not to retaliate, would only demonstrate how dedicated Mangus was to peace with the Americans. Other Apache were having similar tense engagements, and despite Mangus's commitment, relations 
were starting to crack. In the next year, 1861, they would completely shatter. Completely separate from Mangus Coloratus was the infamous Bascom Affair. If you are not familiar with the incident, the Chiricahua are accused by Lieutenant George Bascom of having kidnapped a boy named Felix Ward off of a local ranch. He was actually kidnapped by a completely different group of Apache. Regardless, the army meets with Cochise along with several of his family members. Cochise is Mangus Coloratus' son-in-law, probably the most powerful Apache chief at this point. Mangus Coloratus was over 70. The Americans took Cochise hostage, but he escaped by cutting a hole through a canvas tent with a knife before running off into the mountains. His family was not able to escape. Cochise then captured several Americans and in the days that followed tried to negotiate a prisoner exchange with the Americans. The negotiations failed and Cochise in turn tortured his prisoners to death. He left them mutilated for the army to find. In return, Lieutenant Bascom had Cochise's family hanged. As a result of this incident and the offenses of the miners, Mangus Coloratus joins Cochise and they agree to go to war with the Americans. They wanted to force them to leave their territory entirely. Near Cook's Canyon, south of the Pinos Altos Mountains, raids against Americans in the area would kill over a hundred. A verifiable number. The canyon got a reputation for it. This part of the story offers the first real glimpse of what it was like to battle the Apache. It wasn't just that they fought and killed. Their brutality cannot be overstated. One commander wrote that Cook's Canyon was, quote, sadly defaced with human bones and graves, end quote. Torture of prisoners was common, and Cochise particularly had a habit of suspending people upside down about a foot and a half over an open fire. Due to the hostilities, the Americans returned with a new approach to the Apache. Major General James Henry Carleton was put in charge of operations in New Mexico, and he took on a policy that was intolerant. As Cochise and Mangus planned their next attack, Carleton was instituting a policy of extermination. In July 1862, Mangus Coloratus and Cochise attempted to attack a large group of Americans going through the Apache Pass in Arizona. Cochise felt that his 200 warriors would have an easy victory over the 95 Americans that would have to travel 40 miles without water to get to the pass. What should have been a massive victory turned into a disaster. With no water between the pass and Tucson, the Americans would have to go to an abandoned station in the area with a spring. Just a few hundred yards from the spring is where the Apache would launch their attack. Initially, they had the upper hand from a numerical advantage and the element of surprise. But the Americans were equipped with howitzer cannons, a weapon the Apache were unprepared for. In the battle, they used sheltered positions to send rifle volleys at the Americans but they were destroyed by returning cannon fire and the Americans were able to get the Apache to retreat. The Americans were still worried about their supply lines. Following just miles behind them were countless wagons that were vulnerable. Six soldiers were sent out to warn them on horseback. Mangus Coloratus and about another 20 Apache chased the messengers. When they caught up, they shot the horse out from a man named John Teal. He took cover behind the horse as the Apache approached. Teal felt that he was gonna die and he was desperate to take someone with him. He raised his rifle from behind the horse. When he did, he saw a giant among the Apache approaching him. He took aim, fired, and shot him directly in the chest. Mangus Coloratus fell to the ground, and the Apache immediately moved to rescue him, leaving John Teal alive. The Apache then rode through the night and traveled 120 miles with the wounded chief to Janos, where there was a doctor that they knew. When they reached the home of the doctor, they laid Mangus Coloratus on the table. They told the doctor that if he died, they would kill everyone in the whole town. Whether by skill or by luck, Mangus Coloratus lived. But the Battle of Apache Pass was a disaster, and as Mangus would recover, he would be determined to take a different route moving forward. Understanding that the Apache were outmatched by the Americans, Mangus now wanted to find a way for there again to be peace. They have no weapons that can compete with the American cannons. Their warriors were horribly outnumbered by the American soldiers, and it seemed that since their actions at Cook's Canyon, that the political will for the Americans to fight them was in place. He understood that war with the Americans was futile, but for Mangus Coloratus, it was already too late. General Carleton was set on a policy of extermination toward the Apache, one that mirrored their own brutality in Cook's Canyon. Unknowingly, Mangus Coloratus' search for peace was going to lead him to his own end. Before he met with the Americans, Mangus Coloratus conferred again with other Apache leaders like Cochise. 
He told them of his plans for peace and that he wanted to call for a parlay. They tried to talk him out of it, but he believed that it was their only way forward. Mangus went to the Americans in January of 1863. As he rode up to a meeting with a white flag, rifles were raised against him and he was taken prisoner. He was then put into the custody of Brigadier General Joseph West. Carlton had made it clear to West prior that he didn't trust Mangus Colorado's wish for peace and that the policies toward the Apache were to be followed. Before being sent off to the guards, West and Mangus Colorado have a meeting. Through a translator, both men talk past each other, ignoring the injuries of the other and rather symbolically being unable to come to any sort of mutual understanding. Just before Mangus Colorado was sent away, West turned one final time and warned him that if he tried to escape, the soldiers guarding him had been ordered to kill him. That night was dreary and bitterly cold. Mangus Colorado was at the only fire in the camp. Two guards were stationed with him. At around 1 a.m., he laid on the ground wrapped in a blanket that was small for a giant man and light for the conditions. But the old chief didn't complain. To pester him, the guards began heating their bayonets in the fire and prodding his legs and feet. They wanted him to react. After enough abuse was had, Mangus raised a protest, yelling at the soldiers that he was not a child to be played with. At this point, they both raised their rifles and shot him. A third soldier then walked up to the fallen body and put another round through the back of his head. Later, it was discovered that the men were effectively acting under orders. West reportedly had told them, quote, that old murderer has got away from every soldier command and has left a trail of blood for 500 miles. I want him dead, end quote. In the morning, the body was scalped and partially buried after being thrown in a gully. A few days later, after West left on another assignment, the soldiers dug up the body. They decapitated it and boiled the head before sending it to the phrenologist Orson Fowler in New York. When the Apache discovered what happened to Mangus Coloradus, they were enraged like never before. Geronimo later said that the murder of Mangus was, quote, perhaps the worst wrong ever done to the Indians, end quote. Mangus Coloradus had gone to the Americans for peace and he was betrayed. And the Apache believed a person went to the afterlife in the state in which they died, which meant that he would be headless for eternity. With the Bascom affair, the Apache Wars had already started, but if not for the mutilation of Mangus Coloradus, the Apache may have been able to eventually come to peace with the Americans. The reasons why the Americans were forced to fight the Apache for 25 years was that the Apache didn't trust them. The Chiricahua were united as Apache because of the murder despite the inevitable fate that was coming. As for the head of Mangus Coloradus, it is missing to this day. Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. In 1909, Geronimo lay in his deathbed. In Apache, he was among the final Native Americans forced out of his traditional way of life. He had fought the Americans for 25 years as part of the Apache Wars in the Southwest. He had seen his people pushed off their territory, tortured and killed. And he returned that treatment in kind. He was very well known for being a brutal killer. But at nearly 80 years old, dying of pneumonia, he was still angry. As a prisoner, he regretted surrendering and he wished that he could fight more, but not against the United States. If he had his way, he would have gone back into Mexico on the war path. To his dying day, he hated Mexico for what they did to his people. All Apache did. Geronimo wanted more revenge, and Mexico felt the exact same way. Today, we are looking at the ruthless blood feud between Mexico and the Apache. The Apache had many reasons to hate any number of groups. For two centuries, they had been effectively at constant war with the Comanche, and they waged a 25-year war against the Americans that ended their whole way of life. But for many Apache, their hatred for those two groups paled in comparison to how they felt about Mexico, and for good reason. Depending on how you want to count, the Apache had been at war with Mexico on and off since the 1600s. Back then, the territory was controlled by the Spanish. Their refusal to submit to Spanish rule and their constant raiding of Spanish settlements led to a rather contemptuous relationship. 
It got so bad that in the late 1700s, the Comanche and the Spanish teamed up against the Apache in what was a literal attempt to exterminate them. The Spanish and Comanche were so effective that by the 1790s, the raiding from the Apache had basically stopped. Most had been forced off the plains to the mountains, and thousands of Apache, out of necessity, made peace with the Spanish. They even lived outside Spanish presidios. Many go into Spanish schools, taking Spanish names, and even adopting Catholicism. To keep them pacified, the Spanish very intentionally supplied the Apache with rations of food. They felt if they supplied them with food and security that the Apache wouldn't be a problem. And that was mostly true. But things change. What might happen, for example, if the government wasn't able to provide such subsidies? Fast forward to 1821, Mexico becomes independent of Spain. Intelligently, the Mexican government tries to maintain the rations being sent to the Apache. At least, initially. But being a new country and having just fought a revolution, these are hard times, and resources are valuable. The Mexican government rolled back the subsidies in the early 1830s. And wouldn't you know it, without the rations, the Apache began to leave these Mexican towns, and raids to supplement their needs soon follow. I'm sure that there is a societal lesson to learn here. You are encouraged to let me know what it is in the comments. When the Apache began raiding the Mexicans, the Mexicans felt betrayed. They complained that their agreements with the Apache called for them to provide for their own subsistence. They were supposed to be farming outside the Presidios, and the rations were just a supplement. The Apache felt differently. They were never farmers, not truly. Always at least semi-nomadic, they were hunters and raiders. Raiders who took what the land didn't provide. And they were only one generation or two removed from living that way. The old ones still remembered, and they caught back on quickly. The raids were immediately felt by the Mexicans. The targets were not generally people, at first. They were after resources. Cattle, horses, food, guns, and ammunition. All things that people are reluctant to give up and tend to defend, making violence inevitable. The Mexican government tried to make peace with the Apache as a whole, but it never really worked that way, and they could never really figure that out. The whole group of Apache broke into various tribes, and those tribes broke into smaller bands. The government might be able to make peace with one band, but that doesn't mean the next is agreeing to peace. The Mexicans are trying to make agreements with groups of maybe a couple hundred. Meanwhile, a couple thousand are freely ignoring these agreements. To make matters hilariously worse, the Apache struggled to understand Mexican institutions. When the Apache band would make peace with a Mexican town, they viewed that agreement as being with that specific town. They would trade and move freely through the town and then raid the next one over who they didn't feel they had any agreement with or obligation to. The Apache had a difficult time conceptualizing the idea that the town felt they were negotiating on behalf of all of Mexico, or even states like Chihuahua or Sonora, where most of the violence was taking place. There's even a point in Geronimo's autobiography in which the editor, S.M. Barrett, makes a note. In their conversations, they just couldn't get to an understanding on how the Mexican institutions were set up because they were so different from that of the Apache. By 1833, the raids had gotten bad enough that the Mexican government was devoting additional resources to the problem. They looked for public donations to hire additional soldiers and even reduced the salaries of state officials to help fund it, something I do not imagine our politicians agreeing to today. In certain areas, civilian men were even ordered to carry a weapon at all times and be part of local defense forces. The Mexican government was starting to become desperate to solve the problem, and they took measures I would define as escalatory. One of the first things the Mexican government did was institute a scalp bounty. In 1835, the scalp of an adult Apache male would get you 100 pesos. In later years, it would get you even more. Additional bounties for captured women and children were also made. So what was Mexico doing with captured Apache women and children? Well, they were sent off into slavery. It wasn't the most effective practice for the Mexicans. Apache were experts in their environment and in stealth. Not all, but many were able to escape. One fun story includes a lady escaping who, in the wilderness, gets mauled by a mountain lion. Her name was Francesca. She killed it with a knife. It left her pretty scarred, though. Later, she married Geronimo. He didn't mind the scars because he had other, prettier wives. In addition to scalps and slavery, Mexican leadership often resorted to trickery. In 1837, near the Santa Rita Copper Mine, a group of 50 Apache were discovered by a group led by John Johnson. The Apache were led by Juan Jose, a man who was educated in Mexican schools outside the Presidios. Feigning friendship, Johnson invited the Apache into their camp with promises of gifts, like flour and liquor. While the Apache were feasting and drinking, they were surrounded by soldiers. 
Without warning, a cannon and several rifle volleys were launched at the Apache, killing Juan Jose, as well as around 20 others. Alcohol is hiding in the background of many historical downfalls, but with the Apache, it is littered all over the place. Some leaders in subsequent years will only allow half of their warriors to drink on any given night or celebration because it was a common tactic of Mexican officials to seek the Apache out when they were intoxicated. All of this, the scalp bounties, the slavery, and the trickery, backfired horribly on the Mexican government. The leadership felt brutal, punitive expeditions would dissuade the Apache. But that's just not who they are. They are a rough people. It took the combined efforts of the Spanish and Comanche to do it in the decades prior. Further, when John Johnson's group killed Juan Jose, he was replaced with Mangus Coloradus, maybe the most talented war chief the Apache ever had. He led retaliatory raids against the Mexicans in Santa Rita. One raid in particular led to the killing of 22 fur trappers. Locals were so freaked out by the incident that they fled in mass to the Janos Presidio nearby. Three or four hundred of them. They didn't make it. The majority were killed or captured by the Apache en route. The Santa Rita copper mine remained closed for most of the next 35 years. So did the Mexican government learn anything? Maybe think of a different approach? Of course not. That's not how blood feuds work. They raised an army of 200 men in 1839 to further suppress the Apache. It was led by a North American named James Kaiser. And Kaiser was effective, kind of. It's crazy how many times this happens among both the United States and Mexico, but they take a very any Indian is a bad Indian kind of approach, and they wind up killing friendly Apache who are negotiating for peace. It's another example of both sides not understanding the social structure and institutions of the other. As a result, the Apache further increased their rating. The Apache had a chief in addition to Mangus Coloradus who was very effective at leading warriors. Whoa. In reading, there are a lot of pronunciations and spelling. The most common is J, but in Apache writings, Wo, I think, comes up more often. When the Americans tried to force his band to the San Carlos Reservation, he refused. He viewed life on reservation as basically slavery, which is fair. To avoid the Americans, he went into Mexico. To him, the Mexicans to the south were invaders on their traditional lands. After a series of attacks, the Mexican governor of Chihuahua at one point was able to get a meeting with Wo. A lot of Apaches spoke at least some Spanish, so translating wasn't usually that bad. The governor didn't even try to negotiate for all the raids to stop. He pleaded that the Apache limit themselves to just stealing male cattle. He was afraid of the herd's population collapsing if the Apache continued to take females. That part of the conversation made sense to Wo. Then the governor demanded that the killing and scalping of Mexicans stopped. At this point, Wo went into a rage. He let the governor know that historically the Apache did not practice scalping, which is true. Many Native American groups did, but not the Apache. It was something they picked up from the Mexicans when the government placed the literal scalp bounties on their heads. And just to turn the knife, he let the governor know that he knew why the bounties had been walked back in the 1850s. In the decade prior, thousands of scalps were turned in and paid out by the Mexican government but the entire Apache population was only a few thousand total. As it turns out, it is very difficult to tell the scalp of one Indian from another, or even an Indian from a Mexican. And the Mexican government was becoming increasingly aware that they were paying these bounties for people other than the Apache. Have fun going down the mental road of what all of that really means. Through the 1830s and 40s, the casualty numbers are difficult to confirm. But between the Mexican states of Chihuahua and Sonora, we are talking about something to the effect of 6,000 deaths among the Mexicans and maybe 1,000 among the Apache. All of this leads us back to where we started, Geronimo. The blood feud between the Apache and the Mexicans is undeniable, but Geronimo embodies Apache hatred for Mexicans better than any other example. In the summer of 1858, 400 Mexican soldiers found an Apache rancheria outside of Janos. The Apache men, including Geronimo, were in town trading. When the soldiers attacked the village, there was really no defense. Many Apache were killed, but among them were Geronimo's wife, his mother, and his three children. From that point on, Geronimo never forgave Mexico. He vowed vengeance and took his rage out on them every chance he got. The best example would come in 1859. In his own book, Geronimo details what happened. He was able to raise a war party for an attack. They entered Sonora and made their way toward Arispe, a place that used to be the state capital until the Apache raids forced Mexico to move it. Eight of their party went toward the town. Any man they found was killed and scalped, 
and a woman or child was captured and brought back to camp. But that was only the start. This was bait. When the kidnappings and murders were discovered, the town would send troops into the mountains, and the Apache were here for a fight. In an eerie retelling, Geronimo stated that they posted sentinels after the killings that night, but then they, quote, rested quietly all night, for we expected heavy work the next day, end quote. In the early morning, the bodies were discovered, and by 10 a.m., two columns of soldiers, backed by a cavalry unit, were sent up into the mountains after the Apache. Geronimo swears he recognized the cavalry as the same soldiers present when his family was massacred the year earlier. He was ready for revenge. Geronimo led the charge against them, meeting them head-on, something the Apache were not known to do. The battle lasted about two hours. At one point, late in the fighting, Geronimo found himself surrounded in a field with four other Apache warriors, each of them out of arrows, none with functional spears. Fueled by his vow of vengeance, Geronimo drew his knife. Darting back and forth, he avoided the weapons of the soldiers, and he was able to kill several of them. At one point, only he and one other Apache remained in the area. He watched as a Mexican soldier ran his friend through with a saber. Geronimo charged the soldier, and they get into a kind of wrestling match. The soldier holding his saber and Geronimo his knife, both looking for an opportunity for the kill. As they fall to the ground, Geronimo got the upper hand and was able to deal a killing blow. He laid on the ground for a moment, exhausted. As he breathed heavily from the fight, he began to notice that he was covered in the blood of his enemies. As he rolled over, he grabbed the soldier's saber and he kneeled. As he looks up, he sees a field full of dead Mexican soldiers and the surviving Apache staring at him. Witnesses to what took place. After a moment, the silence of the finished battle was broken by the war whoop of the Apache, and before they left, Geronimo ordered them to scalp the dead. One caveat about that story, and this is debated, is that the battle is allegedly where Geronimo had gotten his name. Geronimo's birth name was Goyale. The legend around this story is that as he was in the final stages of the battle, with only his knife, the soldiers were yelling Geronimo, the Spanish word for Jerome, and the soldiers were in fact pleading to Saint Jerome to help them escape Goyale's knife. Again, that is debated, and Geronimo didn't include that in his own autobiography, so I don't know. Some historians think that the Spanish just had a hard time pronouncing Goyale. Regardless, the name stuck. Geronimo's thirst for revenge against Mexico didn't fade. In just two years, 1859 to 1861, he traveled back into Mexico four times with war parties. Joining a war party for the Apache was voluntary. He would have gone more, but he had to convince other people to go. And his hatred didn't make him any friends. He was often criticized by his own people because his rage would get Apache killed. They didn't have the kind of population where reckless violence was tolerable. Nonetheless, many Apache despised Mexico, and he would get volunteers. He would become so notorious that during battles, the Apache reported hearing Mexicans curse Geronimo's name. Raids into Mexico slowed down into the 1870s, but they never really disappeared. The Mexican military did everything they could to track down Apache bands, but they were nearly impossible to find. They were successful sometimes. Mexico was able to track down and kill many Apache, including Chief Victorio at the Battle of Tres Castillo in 1880. After Victorio died, Geronimo, who was never a chief, was looked to as a leader for many of the remaining Apache. During his famous escapes from San Carlos in the mid-1880s, he would visit Mexico many times, and the Apache were viewed as enough of a threat that the Mexican government supplied several thousand troops to aid the Americans in trying to capture him. But I think by now we more or less get the point, so I'm going to try to find a place to wrap this up. Within a couple of years, Geronimo, like most of the Apache, would surrender to the Americans. He would be forced east, but eventually find himself at Fort Sill in Oklahoma. There, as an old man, he contributed to his autobiography. In it, a portion sticks out that really takes home the thoughts on Mexico from the Apache, and Geronimo especially. Quote, I've killed many Mexicans. I do not know how many, for frequently I did not count them. Some of them were not worth counting. It has been a long time since then. But still, I have no love for Mexicans. With me, they were always treacherous and malicious. I am old now, and shall never go on the warpath again. But if I were young and followed the warpath, it would lead into old Mexico." End quote. The blood feud between the Mexicans and the Apache was brutal. The Mexicans would escalate, hoping to pound the Apache into submission. But 
they were not the people to do that to. And every offense led to increasing violence until all both sides knew was hate. I have one more episode on the Apache I would like to do before I wrap up this series. Next time, we talk about those who didn't surrender. The ones that resisted well into the 1920s and 30s. Next time, we talk about the Broncos. A rancher is killed in southern New Mexico. Horse thieves, coming from the south, were after his gun and mule. They took him by surprise. A day later, the body is discovered. Word travels fast by radio and a posse forms, tracking the group as they ride on fresh horses to southern Arizona. This is rugged country. They have to travel as the raiders do. No adequate roads exist for cars to make it through the mountains. A story published from the Silver City Enterprise expresses the frustration of the locals. Quote, A season has not passed when some citizens of Grant County have not lost their lives to this band of cutthroats. End quote. As the posse gets closer to the criminals, they find warm campfires and materials dropped by the fleeing raiders to lighten the loads of the horses. The posse tries to cut off the horse thieves before they can dive back into Mexico, but they're too late. Just as they reach the last ridge before the border, some of the posse see them on horseback before they escape. Eight of them. They are Apache. The year is 1924. Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. The opening describes an Apache raid in 1924. Think about that for a second. Cars and radios existed. Babies born after World War I could be as old as five, and there were still Apache roaming the mountains of the Southwest. There are people living today who were alive in 1924. Not a lot, but some. The Apache were able to exist off-reservation far longer than most people would believe. It's because they were possibly the most elusive people in world history. And today, I'm going to share with you three stories to help explain how that was possible. But before we get started here, if you are new to the channel, I research historical topics I find interesting and explain them in a story format. If that is your kind of thing, subscribe or leave a like and hopefully I can keep building the channel. I release a video or two a month, so be sure to come back for more content. We need just a little bit of context on the Apache so that these stories make sense. The Apache were raiders and nomads, broken into several bands. They inhabited the areas of modern-day Arizona, New Mexico, and northwest Mexico in the Sierra Madre Occidental Mountains. The United States was a little bit late to the scene heading west, so a lot of the earliest known contacts are between the Apache and the Mexicans. They didn't go well. There was lots of murder. That's actually where the Apache got their name. The Spanish adapted the word from the neighboring Zuni tribe. Their word for them was Apache, meaning enemy, and relations between the Mexicans and the Apache will live up to that moniker. There are reasons for the contentious relationship. The biggest is cultural differences. Mexico wanted the Apache to adapt to mainstream society, but the Apache didn't like the idea of toiling away as farmers and laborers. They were raiders. It was a way of life. When an Apache needed things like materials or horses, they got a war party together and they took them. But we all know what happens to horse thieves in the West. For added drama, it wasn't just horses and supplies they would take. Sometimes they would also kidnap people to ransom off, adopt, or torture to death. Many people would say that was also bad. To the Apache, the raids were not even necessarily about animosity. They were about subsistence. The region they lived in didn't provide much. It was hard country, arid and hot and mountainous, Rattlesnakes fucking everywhere. If your people needed something, a way to get it was to take it from others. People will, however, get protective of their things, so sometimes people die. These societies in the 1800s, both Apache and Mexican, didn't exactly have strong and effective political institutions to arbitrate their disputes. So people do it, and that often creates blood feuds. You stole our horses and killed our brother? Now we're going to burn your village and kill your family. The path to escalation is obvious and the cycle of violence will last in notable ways into the 1880s and in less obvious ways far longer. This type of lifestyle does develop a skill set and character that is unique, the kind that makes it possible to survive and hold out longer than any other tribe. And that's where we get to our stories. The Apache were experts of their environment. They knew everything around them to forage and were so familiar with their territory that they knew every watering hole and every cave available to them. Their skills made them difficult to find and these mountains provide a lot of cover. When armies were coming to Apache lands, finding them was always an issue. 
The US military would literally often have to hire Apache scouts just to relay messages back and forth to different bands in the area. They were experts in stealth. The Apache would dress very simply. It's not the way we picture groups like the Lakota with massive feathered headdresses. And when they needed to be stealthy, they would often strip down to a breech cloth and moccasins, taking off their shirt because their skin would serve as better camouflage against the red and brown earth. John Kremeny wrote a book in 1868 called Life Among the Apaches, and although he never truly lived with them, the guy is about as legit as you could be at the time. He is likely the first white man to speak the language, and he spent an incredible amount of time with them. He witnessed something that's hard to believe, and recounts a story of an Apache that literally disappeared right next to him. Quote, while crossing an extensive prairie, dotted here and there by a few shrubs and diminutive bushes, Quick Killer volunteered, while resting at noon, to show me with what dexterity an Apache could conceal himself, even where no special opportunity existed for such concealment. The offer was readily accepted, and we proceeded a short distance until we came to a small bush, hardly sufficient to hide a hair. Taking his stand behind this bush, he said, Turn your back and wait until I give the signal. This proposition did not exactly suit my ideas of Apache character, and I said no. I will walk forward until you tell me to stop. This was agreed upon, and quietly drawing my pistol, keeping a furtive glance over my shoulder, I advanced, but had not gone ten steps when Quick Killer hailed me to stop and find him. I returned to the bush, went around it three or four times, looked in every direction. There was no possible covert in sight. The prairie was smooth and unbroken. It seemed as if the earth had opened and swallowed up the man. Being unable to discover him, I called and bade him to come forth, when to my extreme surprise he arose laughing and rejoiced within two feet of the position I then occupied. With incredible activity and skill, he had completely buried himself under the thick gramma grass within six feet of the bush and had covered himself with such dexterity that one might have trotted upon him without discovering his person. I took no pains to conceal my astonishment and admiration which delighted him exceedingly, and he informed me that their children were practiced regularly in this game of hide-and-seek until they became perfect adepts." End quote. It sounds impossible, but is it really? People can hide in plain sight. Animals do it all the time. I'll show you. There is a tiger in this picture. It's on the screen right in front of you. Can you see it? Found it! It's hard to imagine a people that can hide like that, but Kremeny says they could. General George Crook, an Indian hunter who will come this close to catching Geronimo in our third story, famously described the Apaches as having an acuteness of sense, perfect physical condition, absolute knowledge of locality, and an absolute ability to persevere from danger. Crook added, quote, we have before us the tiger of the human species, end quote. Think of what you saw in the video with the tiger and the story you just heard. The Apache are everything an apex predator needs to be, and into the 1860s, they are going to be backed into a corner. Relationships between the Americans and the Apache, specifically the Chiricahua, one of the bands, are going to take a bad turn in 1861. By the time of the Mexican-American War, the Apache had already been fighting Mexicans for many moons, but the Americans were new to the scene. They had to kill a lot of people to make it that far west. But the process was expedited when they found gold. The story played out in a familiar sense. Mexico claimed land occupied by the Apache, and they were like, hey, we live here. And then the American take that territory, including where the Apache live, and again, they are left like, who the hell are these guys? Regardless, the Americans and the Apache get along pretty well for a while, until in 1861 when a little white boy goes missing. The Chiricahua had a chief named Cochise. He was called to meet Lieutenant George Bascom in regard to a young boy, Felix Ward, who had been taken in a raid. Bascom believed the Chiricahua took the boy, but they didn't. It was actually Apaches though, but White Mountain Apaches, not the Chiricahua. But that didn't stop Bascom from getting overly aggressive and effectively taking Cochise and several of his family members as prisoners. That didn't go well. Cochise was in a tent with Bascom, and when it was made clear to him through a translator that he was in fact a prisoner, he wasn't having it, and he pulled a knife that he had concealed and instantly cut his way out of the tent they were in, sprinting into the surrounding wilderness. Cochise escapes, but unfortunately his family was not as lucky. For leverage, Cochise captured some Americans in order to exchange them for his family. Bascom, however, refused the trade, demanding that the boy, Felix Ward, be returned. I will remind you that the Chiricahua never had the boy. Cochise fled to Mexico, outside the jurisdictions of the Americans, but before he did, he tortured his three prisoners to death and left them for Bascom to find. 
Bascom will in return hang his Chiricahua captives, some of them family members of Cochise. This event is commonly called the Bascom Affair. It will lead to conflict between the Americans and Apache for decades. It probably helped the Apache that the Civil War was going on, the United States was distracted, but Cochise was able to continue raiding and he avoided capture until 1872. During that time, he and his people held up in the Dragoon Mountains, using the natural resources and natural cover to avoid the military. They would move around and conduct raids in nearby areas. With few exceptions, they avoided pitched battles and stayed hidden, relying on covert actions. Cremony, in his book, compared the behavior of the Americans to the Apache during this time. He was an Apache, but in this section he writes as if it's them talking. Quote, The Americans are brave, but they lack astuteness. They build a great fire which throws out so much heat that they cannot approach it to warm themselves, and when they hear a gun fired, they are absurd enough to rush to the spot. But it is not so with us. We build small fires, in secluded nooks, which cannot be seen by persons unless close by, and we gather near to them, so as to obtain the warmth. And when we hear a gun fired, we get away as soon as possible to some place from which we can ascertain the cause." End quote. He goes on to explain that the Apache, quote, regard our daring as folly, and think discretion the better part of valor, end quote. That says a lot toward their values and their thought process toward conflict. The Apache were aggressive, but not reckless. Additionally, the land was hard, but the Apache could stay there because they knew the natural environment so well. They knew how to get meat and what plants to eat, including sunflower, weed seed, wild grasses, wild onions, fruit of cactuses, berries, and nuts. Paul Hutton wrote a book called Apache Wars. In it, he says, quote, It was a land where every plant bore a barb, every insect a stinger, every bird a talon, every reptile a fang, an inhospitable, deadly environment known to the outside world as Apacheria, end quote. But up in those mountains, the Apache could thrive, only coming out when they meant to take supplies that they needed. That part, however, the raiding, is what is going to keep the military on their back. The Apache Wars ended in 1886 with the surrender of Geronimo. If you don't know, Geronimo isn't just a funny word you say when you jump from a high surface. He was a medicine man and a warrior who will elude capture for much of his adult life. He's a Chiricahua, but one that his own people and maybe even the army believed had supernatural powers. As a young man, his wife and several of his children were viciously murdered by Mexican soldiers. As the story goes, after he found them, he heard the voice of Usen, a god, who told him that he will never die in battle, nor will he die by gun, and that the god will guide his arrows. I've always wondered how many made that claim and no one talks about them because it turns out that they were wrong. He was also supposed to be able to see faraway events as they happened, and his people say that one time he kept the sun from coming up an extra few hours. All useful skills when you are fighting people your whole life and evading capture. Regardless of supernatural ability, the man was respected by his people and had a reason to distrust outside governments. But like much of the Chiricahua, he will resign to life on reservation for a time. When the Chiricahua agreed to live on reservation, they were promised a large chunk of land in their home territory, but they were moved to the San Carlos reservation rather quickly. That place led to a lot of trouble. It wasn't what the Chiricahua were promised, and the area was hot and the soil was not good for farming. Disease was also a problem, as was getting the booze they wanted. Many did not want to stay there. Geronimo led his people in breakouts three separate times in 1878, 1881, and 1885. Each time he would travel with a group that, like him, wished for their former nomadic lifestyle. They would flee Arizona and New Mexico and travel south to the Sierra Madre Ocinel Mountains in Mexico. During the breakouts, the Apache would raid, steal, and kill people from the southern parts of the United States, as well as the Mexican states of Sonora and Chihuahua. Naturally, the Mexican and American governments are going to push back on that a little bit. In Geronimo's last escape, he was on the run with a little over 130 people. Famously, a quarter of the U.S. military was used to try to capture him. 5,000 troops. An additional 3,000 Mexican troops were helping, as well as over 100 hired Apache scouts. Literal Apache hunting Apache. Mexico had a vested interest in stopping him, as it was alleged that during that year and a half he was on the run, his people may have killed hundreds of Mexicans. He was pursued all year, relentlessly, traveling back and forth between Mexico and the United States, raiding as they go for supplies. One of the reasons the Apache were so hard to catch was that on horseback they could travel as many as 70 miles in a day in rugged terrain. They would literally run their horses to death, butcher them for their meat, and then steal more horses, and then do it again. Geronimo was almost caught in January of 1886. U.S. Captain Emmett Crawford led a group that located and captured Geronimo's materials and horses. 
Geronimo, with nowhere to go, was set to surrender. But at the last minute, Mexican forces, also looking for Geronimo, happened upon the hired Apache scouts. They were helping the Americans search for Geronimo's group. The Mexicans attack the scouts, thinking they are with Geronimo, or perhaps they're just trying to cash in on a scout bounty provided by the Mexican government, but a battle ensues. Crawford himself is killed, and Geronimo is able to escape. Just a few months later, in March 1886, General George Crook, from the Tiger Quote, caught up with him again and negotiated Geronimo's surrender. There is a literal picture of this meeting, which is just incredible. Geronimo was getting boxed in, and he had been on the run for a long time. But before his final agreement, soldiers selling whiskey to the Apache may have told them that if they crossed the border into the United States, there were plans to kill him. So instead of doing that, Geronimo and 39 of his people escaped in the middle of the night. This time, those remaining made it till September, when after a full year and a half of constant pursuit, Geronimo finally surrendered for real. They made it a full year and a half, with thousands of people looking for him. That's how elusive and resourceful these people were. This time, when Geronimo was caught, the Americans didn't send him back to reservation. They sent him to the worst place imaginable, Florida. If you like Florida now, that's great, but they didn't have air conditioning back then, and I bet you don't let your grandma swim near the Everglades. Geronimo won't be there forever. He'll be moved from time to time, but he's effectively held captive for the rest of his life. Largely because there was real fear that releasing him would mean more rebellions and violence. He does meet Teddy Roosevelt, though. I opened this episode on Apache Raid from 1924. We didn't get all the way to 1924, and this episode is long enough, so we're going to find a place to stop. Even though Geronimo was captured in 1886, not all of the Apache were. Some escaped reservations and returned to their resourceful life in the mountains. Raids and all. The 1924 attack was the last recorded Apache raid in the United States, but there are records of raids in Mexico into the 1930s, and some serious claim that the Apache lived in those mountains until the 1950s. There are a lot more stories that show just how capable and elusive the Apache were, but there's a comment section below. Let me know if you want to hear some more. Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. Today we have three more stories about the elusive and terrifying Apache. Take a look at this picture. What you see here are three Indian scouts from the Apache Wars. All of them helped track down Geronimo in 1886. One of them would go on to win a Medal of Honor. Two of them would go on to become outlaws, hunted by the army they used to serve. Their adventures are what Old West stories are made of. Blood feuds, raids, prison escapes, and journeys of survival. One story even has a train, if you like trains. But before we get started, I research historical topics I find interesting and explain them in a way I would to my friends. If that is your kind of thing, please subscribe and leave a like on the channel. If you really like it, share it. It supports me and will help the channel grow. But let's get to our stories. Everyone loves a good outlaw. A good bad guy makes every story more interesting, especially if you can empathize with them. And that's the case with the stories we have today. Our outlaws are good reservation Indians. They worked as scouts, helping the army track down rogue Apache bands. The Apache were the raiders of the Southwest. Bands unwilling to submit to reservation continued to plunder both sides of the U.S.-Mexican border. To stop these war parties, the military would hire Indian scouts to help track them down. The problem was, other tribes feared the Apache, and those scouts would often steer the military clear of them in order to avoid conflict. To find an Apache, you needed Apache. They were among the greatest trackers in the world, and the U.S. Army figured that out really fast. And surprisingly, many Apache were eager to help. Life in San Carlos, Hell's 40 Acres, didn't suit them. It was embarrassing for men the age of warriors to be toiling away as farmers, so they took their skills out of the fields and with remarkable success. Eleven would go on to win medals of honor, like Rowdy from our title picture. Indian hunter General George Crook stated, quote, I cannot too strongly assert that there has never been any success in operation against these Indians unless Indian scouts were used, end quote. They were incredibly successful. But sometimes the relationships with the United States would go bad. Front and center, we have the Apache Kid, probably the most famous Apache outlaw. We will see him again in our second and third stories. But first, let's look at Maasai. Maasai was a Chiricahua Apache and one of the last remaining Apache outlaws. 
Like many Apache men who were kept on reservation, he would struggle to find a balance between what he wanted for himself, his people, and the power of the Americans. He worked as a scout on and off during several campaigns in the 1880s. But he was also a bit of a flip-flopper, finding himself escaping from reservation life several times, only to then return because he missed his family or disliked life on the run. He would then join up with the Americans as a scout and literally help them catch the same Apache that he previously escaped with. It's like snitching on your friends because you want someone to hang out with in prison. Speaking of prison, when Geronimo and his renegades were finally captured for the last time in 1886, Masai was arrested with them. It's not perfectly clear why, but it appears the army was sick of his double agent routine and called for him to be sent away because they viewed him as dangerous. He was sent with Geronimo on a prison train to Florida. There are several versions of what happened next, but one thing is not in dispute. Masai got off that train. In one version, he is told by an officer that all prisoners who have a red handkerchief would be hanged when they got to Florida. As a scout, it would make sense that Masai would have one of those since scouts usually were given a red handkerchief to distinguish themselves from other Indians who were not scouts. Maybe the guard was lying, or maybe it was a marker. The prison train cars with Apache were only sporadically populated with guards. They were secure prison cars, but they are dirty and dingy and the guards didn't spend a lot of time in there. With limited supervision, Masai teams up with a Tonkawa friend that he has on the train, Grey Lizard. Together, they wiggle the bars free from one of the windows, and over time they make enough space to escape. They waited for the train to be traveling uphill, because it had to slow down. They check to see that no guards are present, and Masai and Grey Lizard just jump out. Using the classic tuck and roll technique, they remain unscathed, and the train just keeps moving. Maybe they got lucky, and no guards noticed the jump. Maybe the guards assumed they had died in the attempt, but once that train passed, their problems only started. They have no supplies, they are dressed in Apache moccasins and breech clouts, which are terrible disguises, and they are in Missouri, 1,200 miles away from home. What are a couple of bros to do? They start walking west. Masai and Grey Lizard travel by night, and hid by day. Night after night, they use the Dipper constellation in order to determine which way to go. They tried to kill quail and rabbits with rocks with limited success. They ate roots, but they didn't have enough food. Many years later, Masai's daughter would recount the story. She said, quote, They had nothing but breech clouts and moccasins, so they suffered with cold as well as hunger, but it is hard to starve in Apache. End quote. Then, just when they needed it, they catch a break. In the Ozark Mountains, a big fire led them to a mining camp. Gray Lizard and Masai snuck up on the camp. They patiently waited, and in the morning, when the workers entered the mine, they stole everything they could carry. Meat, bread, coffee, and maybe most importantly, two guns, ammunition, and knives. Now they could hunt. As they move west through Oklahoma and Texas, the climate gets drier and more desert-like. Using an old Apache trick, they used the stomach of a deer as a water bag so they could stay hydrated. That is, until Grey Lizard tripped while holding it, and it got torn by a prickly pear. A day later, thirsty and unable to go on, the two dropped to the ground. They prayed for rain. In a stroke of luck, or divinity, they got it. For the second time, just when they needed it, they got some relief. As it poured, the two men were able to drink and keep going. They made their way to New Mexico. They knew where they were when they saw the Capitans. They were not far from the Sierra Blanca and Mescal Mountain. This is now the fall of 1887. It had been a full year and 1,200 miles since they escaped the train. The two friends then separated. Masai stayed in the Sierra Blanca. Gray Lizard split to go to his family in the Mescal Mountains. But Gray Lizard didn't make it there. Something happened and no one ever saw him again. Masai, on the other hand, was now one of the most wanted renegade Apache. But we will get to what happens to him in our third story. First, I want to tell you about the most famous Apache outlaw. Following the capture of Geronimo, the most famous of the Apache outlaws was Haske Bene Diantel. But that's hard to pronounce, so many American soldiers will refer to him as the Apache Kid. He was born around 1860, a member of the Western Apache. As a child, he was captured by Yuma Indians, but was freed by the U.S. He stuck around the army camps, and this is where he meets Al Sieber. Sieber was the chief of army scouts. He was famous for it. 
Everyone in these camps thought the kid was smart and friendly, but Seaver saw how skilled and ambitious he was, and he took him under his wing. He effectively adopted the boy by the time he was a teenager. As early as 1879, the Apache kid enlisted in the army as an Indian scout, and he thrived. He was promoted within his first year, and he became one of Seaver's most trusted men, serving in several campaigns to help catch Geronimo, as well as other battles against the Coyotero and White Mountain Apache. The kid even adopted an American style of dress, although that wasn't uncommon. Among the Apache, it was considered very fashionable to dress like the Americans. But the kid and Seaver's relationship took a dark turn. The Apache kid's real father lived at the San Carlos Reservation. But in 1886, he was murdered, and the incident escalated into a blood feud. One man, the kid believed to be involved in the murder, named Rip, had gotten away, and that was unacceptable. Apache culture is not one to wait for arbitration. The kid was honor-bound to go after Rip for vengeance. It was his duty. Knowing that going after this man would cause problems, the kid goes to Seaver first to seek his permission, but he's denied. The kid doesn't take it well, but he respects Seaver. In the moment, he listens, but he doesn't forget. He decides to be patient. Six months later, in May of 1887, Seaver had to leave San Carlos, and he left the Apache kid in charge of the guardhouse while he was gone. This was his opportunity. The kid tracks down Rip and kills him, as he had felt honor-bound to do. But Seaver's coming back, and he knows that what he did may cost him everything. The kid goes on the run with friends of his that helped him, and when Seaver gets the news of the murder, he orders him to return and face justice. Staying on the run means that he will be tracked by the army as other Apache had been. The kid knows Seaver has a temper, but he hopes that he will understand enough that the army might be lenient. So, after some negotiating, mostly just to make sure army guns were not going to be blazing the second they saw him, he returns to meet with Seaver. Seaver and the kid meet in the street, and a crowd gathers. During the meeting, someone in the crowd fires their gun. Maybe friends of Rip who were going after the Apache kid, maybe friends of the kid going after the officers. Regardless, Seaver is shot in the ankle, and it shatters. He lived, but it left him a cripple. The kid doesn't stick around and again he takes off to escape. He saw the writing on the wall. If he stayed, Jack Ruby was going to get him. This was the last straw for Seaver. He already felt betrayed, but now he blamed the kid for his injuries, a man who he used to think of as a son. And from his perspective, the kid caused this whole mess, then took off and didn't even try to help him. From that point on, he will hold on to his grudge. The kid only made it a few weeks on the run before surrendering again. No violence took place this time. He was then court-martialed and charged for his crimes. Originally, he was actually sentenced to death, but the sentence was soon reduced to 10 years, and he was sent to Alcatraz Prison in San Francisco. The kid was in prison for a year, but in a stroke of luck, his case fell under military review in April of 1888. Prejudice was found in the trial, and he was released and sent back to San Carlos. The kid's demeanor now matched the change we had previously saw in Sieber. Formerly outgoing, friendly, and ambitious, he was now jaded with life on reservation. As a scout, he had a job and status. Now he had nothing, and he didn't trust the Americans. He didn't cause trouble, he mostly just stayed at the fringes of the territory. But Seaver, still holding his grudge, wasn't done with the kid. A new Supreme Court ruling had kicked federal crimes of Indians back to the territories where they lived. Even though illegal, the territorial courts retried any Indians they felt were troublemakers under the new rules. A crippled Seaver, forced to live on crutches, took his vendetta with the kid to trial, and made sure the kid was put up for trying to kill him. The thing was that everyone knew the kid had not fired the shot that had shattered Seaver's ankle. Seaver had said as much in the days after the initial incident, but the kid was once again convicted, and this time was sentenced to seven years at the Yuma prison in Arizona. The relationship had crumbled, but Al Seaver had gotten his revenge. He thought. The guards still had to get the Apache kid to Yuma, and now he had nothing to lose. Eight people were being sent to Yuma with the kid. The first leg of the trip was by stagecoach, and they were meant to get the rest of the way there by train. The Apache prisoners had a stagecoach driver and two guards, sheriffs. One was Glenn Reynolds, fit in his mid-thirties. The other was William Hunky Dory Holmes, a less formidable man with heart problems. On the second day in the stagecoach, they reach a stretch of road called Kelvin Grade. It was steep, and the area had been raining for the two days before. Most of the prisoners were required to walk up the hill to take the burden off the horses, but not the Apache kid. He stayed in the coach because Reynolds and Holmes considered him too dangerous to be set free. It does turn out that other Apache are also dangerous. 
While trudging up the hill, some of the Apache prisoners saw an opportunity. They slowly surrounded Holmes before pouncing on him. He was quickly overpowered and the prisoners took his gun. Both he and Reynolds were shot before they were able to react. Meanwhile, the coach driver, Eugene Middleton, was plodding up the hill with his horses when he had heard gunshots. Just as he saw the Apache were loose, he was shot in the face and the bullet came out his neck. Laying on the ground, helpless, two Apache approached Middleton with a rock. The Apache kid was let out of the stagecoach and he too walked up to Middleton. He had every reason to finish him, but he didn't. According to Middleton, he actually survived despite being shot in the face because the Apache kid called the others off, saving his life. Knowing better than to trust the justice system at this point, he and the others then scattered into the bush. Within a year, by late 1890, all of the prisoners from the escape, called the Kelvin Grade Massacre, were captured, except for the Apache kid. But not for lack of trying. Rewards for his capture, dead or alive, were offered up to $5,000. A lot of money in those days. Although there are many reports for what may have happened to him, he would never be definitively found. The Apache Kid and Maasai were not the only two Apache outlaws hidden in the Sierra Madre Mountains into the 1890s. Well into the early 1900s, many people in the region felt there could be at least a hundred or more Apaches still out there. The Mexicans called them Bronco Apaches. Maasai's escape and the Apache Kids took place within a few years of each other. Afterward, dozens of unknown crimes were credited to both men, but very few are known to be truly committed by either. So what happened to them? We don't actually know for sure, but we are not lacking rumors. A great article by Lee Paul had this to say, quote, between the years of 1890 and 1906, numerous reports circulated that both Maasai and the Apache Kid were dead. John Horton Slaughter, Wallapai Clark, Jack Ganshorn, and Mickey Free all claimed to have killed the kid, while a New Mexico posse said they had gotten Maasai. One or the other of the two renegades was said to have been found dead in a cave, killed in a cornfield, ambushed at a water hole, shot off his horse, or brought down by Mexican rurales. Yet no one ever produced a body or collected a reward." End quote. We don't know definitively, but there are a couple stories that pique my interest. One by Maasai's own daughter. Around 1900, Maasai was traveling north in the Sierra Madres with his wife and young child. They were traveling to a reservation. Maasai thought life in the mountains had become too dangerous. He couldn't go live on reservation himself, but he could escort his family. While traveling, Maasai spotted dust rising on the trails in the distance behind them. Someone was following them. The Mexican rurales were always trying to track him down. Maasai sent his family up the trail, but he stayed behind and waited, concealed by a tree. Then he saw them, two Mexicans. He shot one, but the other was able to rescue his companion and get him on his horse before riding off. Within hours, they had reported what happened and the military came after Maasai in force. Within a day, he was found and shot. No reward for his killing was ever claimed. Instead, it said they built a big fire, decapitated him, and boiled his head. It's possible they didn't know who he was, or maybe they wanted to send a message. The brutality between the Mexicans and the Apaches are well documented. In Apache religion, mutilation is a fate worse than death, because you go into the afterlife as you are buried. The fate of the Apache kid is just as mysterious. It's likely he had gotten help from his mother. She allegedly would leave caches of ammunition, food, and clothing in a cave for him. It was common for the Apache to keep goods hidden like this. His sister says that he visited her frequently until 1896 when he stopped. Was he dead? Well, in 1899, Mexican rurales reported that he was living peacefully in the Sierra Madres. The kid's nephew said he was alive in Sonora in 1924, and others reported he visited friends at San Carlos as late as 1935, at which point he would have been around 75 years old. I'm reluctant to make this a longer series than it needs to be, but I have more stories on the Apache I would like to tell. Particularly, there are some stories of people who were captured, and some that I found in regards to the last remaining Bronco Apache. But there's a comment section below. Let me know if you want to hear them. Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. The American frontier in the mid to late 1800s was a dangerous place for new settlers. The Southwest was home to Native Americans like the Apache. They were raiding people, 
A brutal reputation and expertise and stealth made them terrifying. And they would live up to their reputation. If settlers were lucky, they got away with their property or cattle before they even knew that they were there. But many were not lucky. Raiding societies inevitably have high mortality rates. In order to sustain your population, kidnapping your rival's children becomes a viable option. Today, we will explore the stories of two of the most significant kidnappings ever committed by the Apache. The first is the story of Mickey Free, whose abduction caused a war between the Americans and the Chiricahua. The second is the story of Charlie McComas, a young boy whose kidnapping remains one of the great mysteries of the late 1800s. But before we get started, I research historical topics I find interesting and explain them in a way I would to my friends. If that is your kind of thing, please subscribe and leave a like on the video. If you really like it, share it. It supports me and it will help grow the channel. But let's get to our stories. Mickey Free was one of the most famous of the Apache scouts. Look through the images. He comes up constantly because between 1872 and 1886, he was present on the majority of major military campaigns at the time. But despite living with the Apache and working with them as a scout, Mickey Free wasn't born one. As a child, his name was Felix Ward, and he lived on a ranch in the Sonosha Valley in southern Arizona. That is where he was captured. Many settlers were taken by raids, but this one was different. His kidnapping was going to trigger the longest war in American history. Even more crazy is that Mickey Free will help end the war 25 years later after the Apache found him hiding in that peach tree. Quote, We can reasonably surmise young Felix's state of mind as his captors carried him away from the Sonosha Valley in 1861. Here was a skinny, five and one half foot tall, 13 year old boy. His childhood made wretched by the constantly marauding Apaches. Now he found himself in the hands of Los Barbaros, the boogeyman of his youth. He must have expected horrible torture and lingering death." End quote. When Felix was 13, he was playing outside in a peach tree. His stepfather, John Ward, was away on business. This is not the first raid the ranch had experienced. Three times over the past few years they had been hit and their cattle had been stolen. Years later, when asked about his abduction, he said all he could remember was the long ride. The Apache took him, rode east, and disappeared without a trace. Raids were part of Apache culture. They took the resources they needed. They also captured settlers and other Native Americans regularly. And whether they would keep them alive though, that was a legitimate question. Women and young children had a good chance of being adopted into the tribe or being held as slaves or for ransom. Men and teenage boys were almost always killed and the Apache could get creative. Felix was 13. In most cases, he should have been killed, but he wasn't, so why not? He was small for his age and very skinny, making him look younger than he was. That definitely helped. But it was probably because he was blind in one eye, left that way from an infection that he had when he was a baby. The chief of the group that took him took pity on him because he happened to also be blind in one eye. Although that didn't stop him from selling him a few weeks later. John Ward returned home the day after the raid had captured Felix. Immediately, he goes to the military at nearby Fort Buchanan, and they send out Lieutenant George Bascom and 54 men to go get the boy back. Bascom finds a trail heading east to where the Chiricahua Apache live and the Apache Pass, which is actually my background for this episode. Generally, no other group would go that way, so Bascom incorrectly surmised the Chiricahua were the group of Apache that took Felix. What he didn't account for was that new forts being built might cause groups to change their routes and travel to avoid the U.S. military. Using Indian scouts, because you have to to even find the Apache, Bascom made contact with the Chiricahua, and they meet with Chief Cochise in a military tent, and some of his family members came along with him. Cochise was willing to do this because at this time there was relative peace between the Chiricahua and the U.S. Bascom, however, works to change that. He recklessly accused the Chiricahua of taking the boy and demanded that he be returned. He told Cochise that he was their captive until Felix would be brought back. Cochise tried to reason with Bascom, even going as far as to offer his services and helping them find him. But Bascom wasn't having it. Realizing this was a dead end, Cochise springs up, takes a blade out that he had concealed, and in a split second slices through the canvas of the tent and escapes into the mountains. His brother and nephews didn't escape. 
and the military was able to hold them hostage. All further attempts at negotiation fail, so Cochise goes hunting. He finds some Americans to take hostage and offers Bascom in exchange, his hostages for his family back. But Bascom holds his ground and says that he would only take Felix in exchange, who Cochise did not and never had. So what was Cochise to do? Well, he got creative with his captives and Bascom found the mess after he had fled back into Mexico. Bascom, in retaliation, hangs Cochise's family members. This event, the Bascom Affair, starts the 25-year-long Apache Wars, all over a boy, Felix Ward. So let's get back to him. Felix Ward wasn't taken by the Chiricahua, and different sources say different things, but he was either taken by the Pinal Apache or the Arabapa. But he will later be traded to the Coyotero or White Mountain Apache. With the Coyotero, Felix was adopted. We don't have a lot of information of what his childhood was like. His adopted brother, however, famous in his own right, John Rope, a Medal of Honor recipient, said, quote, He was raised with me, but we always treated him like he was one of us. End quote. We know that as an Apache, he went on raids against both Native Americans and white settlers. But it seems that he had very few run-ins with the U.S. military. That is until 1872, when George Crook would force his group to Fort Apache, and he would wind up on reservation. When the Apache were forced to reservations, usually their captives would be reunited with their families. But that didn't happen for Felix. His brother Santiago would find him, but told him that while he was gone, both his mother and his adopted father had died. Santiago tried to get Felix to come home with him, but he decided to stay with the Apache on reservation and become a scout. In November 1872, General George Crook starts trying to enlist Apache to work as scouts for the U.S. Army. It sounds strange, but this appealed to many Apache men. Life on reservation was not suited to warrior culture, but being a scout who seeks out and fights the enemy was. So even though they were pressured to the reservation by the military, it gave them their best option. The military was rather choosy in picking scouts. And in a practice we would find rather offensive today, the soldiers would rename who got in because they had a hard time pronouncing Apache names. When Felix was selected as a scout, he still went by his original name. It seems the Apache never renamed him, which is strange. But it didn't stop the soldiers from doing it. Felix was 5'7 and about 135 pounds. He had fairer skin than the Apache and reddish brown hair. It is commonly said that he was half Irish and half Mexican, but that may or may not be true. Additionally, his one blind eye gave him a menacing appearance. It reminded the soldiers of a character from a popular book, Charles O'Malley, The Irish Dragon. The character was a manservant named Mickey Free. And from that point on, and for the rest of his life, he went by that name. And Mickey Free would turn out to be a hell of a scout and an interpreter. Throughout the 1870s and 1880s, Mickey Free was constantly used by General George Crook, Emmett Crawford, and Al Sieber. The military could never find Apache without the scouts, making them very useful. Having never learned to read and write, we have no documents written by him directly, but those around us give us a sense of his reputation, and he stood out. A soldier Mickey worked with, Tom Horn, infamous in his own right, he probably killed a kid, said, quote, he, Mickey, now spoke both Mexican and Apache like a professor, end quote. Maybe not like a professor. Others said he had a hard time with Spanish verb conjugation, so it was hard to tell if he was talking about something in the past, present, or future. Horn recalled, quote, and was the wildest daredevil in the world at his time, end quote. There are stories, like the ones from John Burke's journals, about how Mickey would throw himself in harm's way by literally running out to the Apache that they were just in a gunfight with to start negotiating. In Horn's eyes, Mickey, quote, was thoroughly qualified for a typical scout and guide in every sense, except for the fact that he had never any regard for his own life, end quote. He was also disliked by many Apache, especially on reservation with the Chiricahua, who he helped force there as a scout. He wasn't nice about his work, and was once called perhaps the worst man on reservation. But his last big adventure would come in 1885, when Geronimo and the Chiricahua break out of San Carlos Reservation one last time. Strangely enough, Geronimo blamed Mickey Free for the Chiricahua leaving. 
When the Americans were given reasons that the Chiricahua fled the San Carlos Reservation in 1885, they blamed Mickey Free. Mickey had arrested some of them for drinking, which was illegal, and for beating their wives, which the Apache argued wasn't. One Apache chief, Nana, is quoted by the reservation authorities to have said of the situation and Mickey, quote, he can't advise me on how to treat my women, end quote. It's really strange, but Nana may technically be correct, at least from his point of view. The Apache were promised when they came to the reservation that they would not be prosecuted for such offenses. But domestic violence was an ongoing issue on reservation, and it tended to tie directly into drinking their favorite beverage, Tiswin. Regardless, in May, about 150 Apache, led by Geronimo, had broken out of San Carlos and fled into Mexico. What followed was a massive effort to catch them. Mickey Free initially worked as a scout and interpreter in their efforts. They were able to catch up and locate the band several times, even getting very close to a few surrenders. But the death of Captain Emmett Crawford in the pursuit and an alcohol and rumor-fueled failure to close the deal in 1885 led to General Crook being replaced by Nelson Miles. He used scouts far less aggressively than Crook and left Mickey Free in a bit of a limbo. That is, until he sent him to Washington to try to handle negotiations with the Apache from there. In July of 1886, Mickey Free and a small delegation of Apache were sent to Washington. Washington wanted interpreters there so that when Geronimo was caught, they would be able to understand and send messages via telegraph. Among them was a scout named Chato, who I only bring up because he will be present in our next story from before he was a scout. The trip is hampered by poor communication due to broken telegraph lines, but by September, Geronimo's band had surrendered for the final time. The remaining Chiricahua were believed to be too dangerous to send to a local prison or to be allowed to return to San Carlos, so they were sent to a more serious prison in Florida. Other Apache they felt were dangerous, like Cheta, even though he was now a scout, were sent there as well. Mickey Free was sent one last time as an interpreter, and for about a month he stayed at Fort Marion in Florida, translating the end of a war that started with his capture as Felix Ward 25 years earlier. Mickey Free lived a long life after the end of the Apache Wars in 1886, but there is a lot we don't know. He never learned to read and write, so we don't have his thoughts about anything or his accounts of events. He's a bit of a mystery, but if you like mysteries, you're really going to like this next story. In 1924, a group of Bronco Apache conducted a raid in New Mexico the last known Apache raid on American soil. Apache went through the countryside, killing a rancher and stealing supplies and cattle. Before they slipped back into Mexico, a white bearded man on horseback was witnessed. Who was this white Apache warrior? A kidnapped child raised Apache? Well, some said it was Charlie McComas. Charlie was a six-year-old boy. In 1883, he lived with his mother and father in Silver City, New Mexico. That year, in late March, his family was having a picnic near Thompson Canyon, a choke point that forces travelers on a specific route. Unbeknownst to them, a sub-chief named Chato led an Apache raiding party of nearly 30 men. They knew of the choke point and were waiting for the unsuspecting travelers. Hours later, the results of the raid were discovered. It appeared from the evidence that the raiders were basically on top of the McComas family before they even knew they were there. Charlie's father, Hamilton McComas, appears to have handed over the reins of their horse-drawn buckboard to his wife, Juniana. He then grabbed his rifle, jumped out of the buckboard, and tried to make a stand while she and young Charlie made a run for freedom. His body was found with seven bullet holes. Despite the heroic efforts of her husband, Juniana didn't make it far. She was overtaken by the raiders. She grabbed Charlie and tried to get away on foot, but was caught and bludgeoned to death, probably with the butt of a rifle. What was missing from the scene was Charlie. It was clear to those searching that the Apache had taken him. Before the locals or military were able to rally and take on the band of raiders, they had slipped back into Mexico. This was a common tactic used by the Apache. The U.S. military was not permitted to cross the border, so border hopping was very useful in conducting raids. It plagued American efforts for years. However, just two months later, in May, a new international treaty gave the U.S. military permission to pursue hostile Indians into Mexico. General George Crook took action immediately. The purpose of the mission was not solely to go find Charlie, but it was one of their objectives. These missions always included Indian scouts. There was never any finding Apache without them. 
and in just a few weeks, the scouts and military forces found Chato's Rancheria. And wouldn't you know it, one of the leaders of the scouts was Mickey Free. A fight breaks out. Many Apaches escape, but nine are killed and five captured. Of those killed, they are not just warriors. Some are women, young and elderly. When the captured were questioned about Charlie, one of the women said he was taken away when the scouts were first detected. But when many of the nearby Apache began to surrender to the army, Charlie never showed up. And the Apache there said in the chaos he had gotten away and ran off. John G. Burke, an officer with the army, wrote about it in his account called An Apache Campaign in the Sierra Madre. He wrote, quote, Charlie McComas was never found. The Chiricahuas insist, and I think truthfully, that he was in the rancheria destroyed by Crawford, that he escaped, terror-stricken, to the depths of the mountains, that the country was so rough, the timber and brushwood so thick, that his tracks could not be followed. Even had there not been such a violent fall of rain during the succeeding nights, all accounts agree in this." End quote. So according to the Chiricahua, Charlie got away in the mountains and in the dense vegetation and with the rain, he was just gone. Well, that's what they said. But that's not what happened. We can say very confidently that what the Chiricahua told the army in the May of 1883 was a lie. But there are two likely possibilities to what actually happened. One explanation comes from Jason Betzinas, an Apache warrior who fought against the U.S. in the 1880s. He wrote a book called I Fought with Geronimo that was published in 1959. He wrote that after Charlie's capture, he began to quickly learn the Apache language and that he was treated kindly. Between March and May, an Apache family had taken him in and effectively adopted him. They expected him to become a full member of the tribe, in time. But in May, when the Apache scouts had attacked the rancheria, many Apache fled taking Charlie with them. In the fighting, the scouts had killed an elderly woman, the mother of an Apache warrior named Speedy, who had already escaped. When Speedy discovered the death of his mother, he went into a rage and bludgeoned Charlie to death with a rock. Now, Bedzina says very clearly he wasn't there for this, but a woman named Ramona, who he knew, was an eyewitness who had told him. The only reason that it took 80 years to come out was because Bedzina wasn't willing to tell the story until everyone involved had passed. But was the story true? Maybe. But the army searched for Charlie for quite some time, and they never found a body. There is one more explanation. In the decades that followed, the Apache were the last holdouts to life on reservation. Although the vast majority had already resigned there by the mid-1880s, isolated groups of them, called Bronco Apache, existed in the Sierra Madre. For years, there were strange sightings and stories of a bearded white man among them. They come from many sources, as recent as 1924 in a raid in New Mexico, or one even later in 1930 when a Mexican village was attacked by these Broncos. Then, in 1940, a woman who had been captured was interrogated. She claimed that the white bearded Apache people had seen had been killed just a few years before, that he was stabbed to death in a fight over a girl. She said his body was thrown into a pit. She even led a team of archaeologists to it. The remains were taken for examination, and it turned out to be a white man who had blue eyes and red hair, just like Charlie. So was this Charlie McComas? Unfortunately, we'll probably never know. Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. Native Americans have myths and stories of people doing things that defy what we believe to be possible. Some were said to have abilities that were incredible and supernatural. Descendants of the Apache claim that chiefs or medicine men could heal the sick, avoid danger, or even foretell the future. They called the ability power. They would use it for the benefit of their tribe. Power made them highly respected and valued by their people. But there was a darker side. Those who used power against their own people were ostracized, banished, or even killed. To the Apache, these were the witches. They feared witches and the damage they could cause. The Apache were always wary of the danger. Today we have five stories about Apache witchcraft. We are going to see how the abilities from the legends are used by them and against them. But let's start with what power was. The concept of power is just as mysterious to the Apache as it was to the 20th century historians who interviewed them about it. Many Apache didn't even want to talk about the abilities that they had seen. 
they felt that they would be ridiculed by Americans who just couldn't understand. A few books try to define it. The best that I have found is that it is a set of abstract forces that derive from natural phenomena. To the Apache, they couldn't be explained, and they warned researchers that their attempts would be met with failure. Power was held by many Apache chiefs and medicine men. They were said to have incredible abilities, like healing, seeing the future, or knowing how they would die. They said they usually got this power when they were adolescents. The Apache would go to a sacred mountain to fast and pray for four days and nights. They would be all alone, with no food, water, or weapons for defense. They were permitted a blanket and nothing else. If they were spoken to at all, it would usually be on the last night of the ordeal, after they had proven their worthiness. They would hear a voice that would talk to them. It would tell them how to obtain their power. Usually, they would have to take the part of an animal, tree, plant, or stone. The voice would then tell them how to use it, and from that point on, they would carry it in a small buckskin pouch. It would hang on a small leather strap around their neck, under their clothes, and it would guide them throughout their entire lives. Power was viewed very differently than superstition, of which the Apache had many. On the warpath, for example, the Apache would use different words for everyday things. They could cut, but not puncture a hole through their meat, and they would rarely travel at night. No, power was different from superstition. These taboos, if not followed, would make for bad omens. But power was a billet. The Apache believed they were given it by their main god, Usum, who spoke directly to them and who they spoke back to. One Apache chief, Nana, was said to always be able to locate and capture ammunition. An important skill, because without lead and gunpowder, a rifle is little more than a club. He also had power over rattlesnakes. He could move and handle them without being harmed. Power related to animals were among the most common listed, but this one was significant to the Apache. As a people, they feared rattlesnakes. Many believe it's why there was a superstition around traveling at night. The snakes commonly hide during the day and hunt at night. Other chiefs could read spider webs. Herman Lehman, an American boy captured by the Apache, said he saw chiefs who could tell the weather by examining spider webs. If a web was thin, long, and high, it was going to be dry. But if it was low, short, and thick, then it would rain. If a power didn't work, the Apache would search for a reason. Maybe their actions had provoked a spirit. In one instance, witnessed by Lehman, a medicine man claimed rain would come during a drought. When it didn't, the Apache became convinced that the Mexican with them, who they had captured, was the reason. The Great Spirit was angry. So to appease the spirit, they carried the Mexican up a great mountain. They bound him hand and foot to a large rock and staked a rattlesnake next to him, just close enough that if he moved, the snake could strike. When they returned to camp, the medicine man repeated his past incantations for rain, and when he did, it began to pour so much that there was a great flood. Many Apache chiefs claimed to control the weather, just like many claimed to have power to heal illnesses or power to tame even the most wild horses. Others claimed to be able to see the future. Willie Neal, a Western Apache medicine man, predicted the arrival of automobiles while on reservation. He foresaw iron objects with eyes that could see in the night, headlights of oncoming vehicles. He said they would be commonplace. As strange as all of this seems to be, these powers pale in comparison to what can be done by two of the most famous Apache, Lozen and Geronimo. Between 1861 and 1886, the Apache were at war with the Americans. Geronimo is among the most famous Native Americans in history, but Lozen, a medicine woman and warrior, played an interesting role in the conflict as well. Both were said to have incredible power. In Apache society, it was the men who took on the role of warriors. But Lozen was an exception to the norm. As the sister of Chief Victorio, she was present for much of the conflict during the Apache Wars. As a child, she was strong and faster than all the boys, and the men respected her enough as an adult that she was commonly invited to council. Apache women wore two-piece dresses made of calico. Lozen took that outfit and added a knife, ammunition belt, and a rifle. The Chief Nana said that she was his right hand, and that she was as strong as a man, braver than most and cunning in strategy. Her place as a warrior is enough to make her stand out, but her power is what makes her a legend to the Apache. She is said to have been able to locate the enemy with precision. When her brother Victorio wished to know the location of an enemy, Lozen, with her power, would stand with outstretched arms, palms up, and pray to Usen. She would then turn slowly, following the sun. When an enemy was in front of her, her palms would change color, and her hands would get a tingling sensation. The intensity of the sensation gave her an indication of how far the enemy was, 
if it was more intense, they were closer. Her nephew, James Kowakla, said that he had seen her do this countless times. Nana said that with this ability, she was a shield to her people. In October of 1880, Victorio and his band of renegades was being pursued by Mexican soldiers. There was a pregnant woman among them who needed assistance. The upcoming fight was no place for her. Victorio ordered Lozen to break away from his warriors and take the pregnant woman to a reservation to be safe as the rest of the Apache continued to trace Castillos. There, without Lozen, Victorio and the Apache were surrounded and massacred by Mexican cavalry. Nearly 80 were killed and another 68 were taken prisoner. Many Apache believed that had Lozen been with her brother, the Mexicans never would have been able to ambush them as they had. Years later, in 1886, she was with Geronimo when they surrendered to the Americans. Here, we get the only known picture of her among the Apache before boarding the prison train to Florida. But speaking of Geronimo... Geronimo's claims to power are much more widely known. The Apache claim his gifts were given to him by Usen following the murdering of his family by Mexican soldiers. His powers were numerous. It was said that he could make it rain, no bullet could kill them, he could see into the future, and even slow time. It all sounds crazy, but there are strange occurrences that are attached to Geronimo. Several Apache claim that when Geronimo would get himself and his people into trouble, he would pray and song. Then strange things would happen. He would be being pursued by Mexicans or Americans, sing about water, and a big rain would start, making his trail more difficult to find, or even halting the progress of his pursuers. In one instance, the Americans trapped him into a cave, but he and the Apache were able to escape. The Americans never found exits in the cave that he must have used. But the Apache claimed there were instances where he used power so the Americans couldn't see his people. An Apache named Perico said Geronimo once talked to the moon and slowed the coming of the dawn. Quote, When on the warpath, Geronimo fixed it so that the morning couldn't come so soon. He did it by singing. They were going to a certain place, and Geronimo didn't want it to be dawn before he reached his objective. He saw the enemy while they were in a level place, and he didn't want the enemy to spy on them. He wanted the morning to break after they had climbed over the mountain, so the enemy couldn't see them. So Geronimo sang, and the night remained two or three hours longer. I saw this personally." End quote. And in one final example, after the murder of Geronimo's family, Usen is said to have told him, You will never die in battle nor will you die by gun. Famously, Geronimo was forced to surrender, but he never died in battle. However, later, when being painted for his autobiography, the painter claimed his body was riddled with bullet scars, as many as 50. All of these powers were used by him in becoming one of the most elusive people in history. Both he and Lozen used their power to benefit the Apache and were highly respected for it. But what about Apache who used their power for harm? Medicine men or shamans were respected by their people because they used their power for the Apache. Witches were the opposite. To the Apache, witchcraft was the wrong use of power. Like a gun or a knife, it can be both good or bad. Apache researcher Keith Basso wrote in Western Apache Witchcraft, quote, Power was bestowed for the benefit of the tribe. There were those who used theirs for evil, and these were regarded as witches. End quote. Shamans were pro-social and prominent in their communities. Witches were not. Witches were feared and shunned by all. They caused tragedy and sorrow. Betraying his people is the worst crime an Apache could make. The punishment was commonly banishment. Because you had to leave your community, tribe, and family, it was viewed as worse than death. The Apache actually believed that locking someone up in prison is more cruel than anything they would ever do. I won't comment on that, but if you've watched the previous episodes in this series, I will let you draw your own conclusions. Witches usually did harm to their people because they had become bitter. They used evil magic that was conjured in deranged ceremonies. Witches would meet in groups at night, usually in caves to remain unseen. There they would dance, holding the body parts of exhumed corpses. Like medicine men, they would carry items around their neck in buckskin pouches. However, instead of being the fur of an animal, a stone, or part of a tree, it was commonly the powdered skin of human corpses, or rattlesnakes. It could be feces, menstrual fluid, or the blood taken from a tree that had been struck by lightning. They would carry their poison with them at all times, and they would use the poison to curse others. It was most commonly administered in food, and because of that, the Apache were always watchful of outsiders who they shared their meals with. 
A witch could also cause harm to people with spells or curses. They would bury their poison near a person's wikia, or a place they would commonly go, and then conduct a ceremonial chant. A witch could increase their effectiveness by repeating what the Apache called bad words four times. Four seems to be a curse number, as the witch might also walk around the person or their home four times. If the poison or curse was effective, then the victim might fall ill quickly or die without any explanation. Other spells might harm crops or cattle. To protect themselves, the Apache might carry tangible items, like the breast feather of an eagle or turquoise beads. Medicine men may also conduct their own ceremonies to counter the work of witches, with their own chants and songs. If someone was suspected of being a witch, then the Apache would most often have a trial, at least what they call a trial. As written by Basso, the Apache, quote, were directed by the headmen of a local group and the suspect was flatly accused of his crime. If he denied it, he was strung up by the wrists from the limb of a tree, just high enough to allow his toes to barely touch the ground. Suspects who refused to admit their guilt were left suspended, and fires might be lit beneath them to hasten their confession. They were questioned repeatedly, and their clothes and belongings were searched for poison." End quote. When found guilty, a witch would most often be banished, although some sources claim that the relative of a witch's victims might kill them. Now, if you are like me, at this point in the stories you might be thinking, did the Apache believe this? And if they did, is any of it real? Power is an incredible part of the Apache story, but in a world of tangible reality, it makes sense for reasonable people to be skeptical of any of the claims made by the sources in the stories. So let's take this home by looking at some alternative explanations as well as the Apache perspective. First off, the Apache, like many Native American groups, had a very different relationship to the environment than we do. We would look like children in the wilderness next to them. Things that they would just intuitively know from a lifetime of experience would leave us speechless. Herman Lehman claimed that medicine men could read spider webs for rain. Well, as it turns out, that may be less of a power and more of an observation. There are modern sources that claim that spiders lower their webs when it's about to rain. These societies can pass down information like that. We have weather.com in our pockets. It's not shocking that I'm not consulting spiders for their opinions on rain, even though they might be better at it. Willie Neal foresaw automobiles as iron objects with eyes that see in the night. But this is also at a time when trains were becoming more and more common out west. There is no reference to size or wheels, and this reference could easily be referring to lantern light as the eyes, as opposed to the headlights that we perceive. There is no historical shortage of people who have made claims that we apply to the future. Lehman himself wrote about how confused the Indians were when they first encountered things like trains. He says they thought they were alive. It is weird that Nana could handle rattlesnakes, but maybe he was a tad Pentecostal. Or, like many of the eccentric people online that we see these days, he is just more comfortable with snakes than most. As for his propensity for finding ammunition, that doesn't feel like luck. Then there's Geronimo. He would sing and make it rain when being pursued, but accounts of rain could easily be coincidence. Sometimes people get lucky, and highly religious societies like the Apache may find meaning in things like that. His famous cave escape was likely the result of there being exits the Americans were unaware of. No one knows where this cave is today, but the Apache were widely known at the time for being aware of every single spring and cave in their environment. I can't write off the stopping of time, but it sounds like a fish story. Someone prays for time to escape, and when they pull it off, it isn't simply that they made it in time, it was that time slowed for them. In an oral history, it makes sense to flavor the story this way. It was divine. As far as the painter seeing past injuries from bullets that never harmed him, in his own autobiography, Geronimo says he was wounded in battle at least eight different times. With the amount of fighting in his life, I would imagine his body is full of scars. Lozen, I can't explain. That one freaks me out. I don't know how she located her enemies. But I will say the sources on her are scant and gathered decades later. Even the quotes by Nana are attributed to him by a secondary source. But what I find most interesting is how there are both positive and negative aspects to power. Apache tribal structure didn't compel people to follow chiefs or medicine men. They were followed because they were respected. If people believed they had some sort of power given to them by God, it seems likely that people would hold them in higher esteem. It was probably better 
for the tribe if they believed that their chiefs and medicine men had special abilities. It would make them worthy of being followed. There are clear social incentives. The opposite is true for witches. Keith Basso writes about this, and it's fascinating. The belief in witches can have positive societal benefits. Most importantly, it encourages social behavior. If you are hostile or violent toward people, they would have reason to do you harm. If you believe in witches, that would be a rather dangerous predicament. Treating your tribesmen and strangers well is therefore in your best interest. Even being accused of witchcraft is a serious indictment. It suggests that you have acted out against your own. Even if it is unproven, people are more likely to ostracize you. It would force you to alter your behavior or potentially be rejected by your family or banished by the tribe. Plus, if there is a trial, you might be hanged over a fire. That's not good. We see the same type of behavior play out today on social media. What do you think cancel culture is? It is us finding witches and banishing them. Problem is, is that people are complicated and one bad moment doesn't make you a witch. Mostly. Basso quotes the Apache as a group and says the best way to stay away from witchcraft is to have many friends. It is good advice in a society that has a reason for both pro-social community and to be wary of outsiders. It also offers an explanation to sudden tragedy or illness. But I do acknowledge that all of that is within itself dismissive. It would be silly to think that my interpretations are the only possible ones, and that the experience of the people who were there when I was not are wrong. The Apache are historically reluctant to talk about their religion, and especially their belief in power, because Westerners like me try to rationalize and debunk what, for many of them, were deeply held beliefs. I want to make it clear that I have nothing but respect for the Apache. I have spent the last nine months of my life researching them and making videos about them. One thing that really made me think was the words of Apache Ace Doc Lugi in Eve Ball's Inda, an Apache Odyssey. He said that Usen would speak to the Apache, the way that we speak to people on the telephone today. Quote, You people no longer believe in God, and that is why he does not speak to you. If you had faith of the old Apaches, you could hear him. End quote. Countless people have experienced things I can't explain. So what do I know? But let me know in the comments. What do you think? Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. In the 1920s, there were still free Apache Indians living their traditional way of life. Yes, those 1920s. They lived in the Sierra Madre Mountains in Mexico, and there could have been as many as a hundred. It wasn't unknown or a mystery. The locals knew. They reported feeling watched, rarely seeing, but knowing the Apache were near. They could hear sounds at night, animal calls that were just not quite right. There were warnings of Apache presence. Children were told not to play in the forest or stray too far from the watch of their parents. The Apache were raiders, known to take young children when they had the chance. More often, cattle or supplies would go missing. A tax ranchers had to pay because if they followed the trails into the hills, they likely wouldn't come back. You were taught that the Apache Wars ended in 1886 with the surrender of Geronimo, but they didn't. These Bronco Apache, as they were called by the locals, would fight on well into the 1930s, until a father, out of revenge, becomes determined to make them extinct. I'm warning you right now, there are no happy endings here. Let's get into it. It's October 1927. Riding on horseback, as fast as they can, a group of Mexican ranchers hurry to the location of the latest Apache raid. When they get to the scene, one man, moving with more urgency than the others, jumps off his horse and rushes to the body of a woman covered in blood on the banks of a trailside ravine. As the others secure the scene, he frantically checks the woman for signs of life. There aren't any. Stab wounds are all over her body. The man kneels and begins to sob. She was his wife. But after just a moment, he stands and with a look of panic, he begins to search the area. Not seeing what he's looking for, he stares into the wilderness. His despair turns into rage. His son was with his wife, and the Apache had taken him. From that day forward, Francisco Fimbres would only live for two reasons. To get his son back, and to kill every damn Apache still living in those mountains. The Apache Wars ended in 1886, technically. That is when Geronimo and his band of about 40 Apache last surrendered to the American government. But Geronimo's Chiricahua were not the last of the Free Apache. There were more holdouts. 
Estimates are just that, estimates, but there may have been as many as a hundred or more Apache living in the Sierra Madre Occidental Mountains well into the 1920s. The locals called them Bronco Apache. They were the survivors. After centuries of constant war, they were still there. The Spanish and Comanche teamed up in the late 1700s to exterminate them. In the 1800s, the Mexican government paid scalp bounties to manhunters to see them wiped out, and the Americans dedicated a quarter of their standing army to Brigham Geronimo. But well into the 1900s, they were still there. They would travel incredible distances, both on foot and by horse, always moving to keep from being discovered. They kept silent, hiding their presence. They would raid locals in rural areas, stealing livestock, but occasionally also killing ranchers or kidnapping women and children before disappearing without a trace into the mountains. To the Mexican, these Broncos were a menace. Boogeymen of an untamed wilderness. Always there, always watching. Never seen, but felt. Truly terrifying. And they all knew they were there. They would hear sounds, like animals, but not quite right. Hunting parties would find camps, still warm with the embers of fires, but with no one in them. To these Apache, the Mexicans were simply obstacles to their survival. In such small numbers, they were mostly left alone. But the Apache decision to raid the Finbrez family put an end to that. Prior to Francisco Finbrez finding his wife dead and his son missing, they were together. They were traveling near a small town in Sonora called Nacori Chico, where they lived. They had two horses. On a narrow mountain path, Francisco was riding along with his young daughter in the rear. Maybe 30 yards ahead was his wife Maria and three-year-old son Geraldo. There, in the foothills of the Sierra Madre, the family continued down the winding path before turning a corner where there was a large boulder on the trail side. There are several versions of what happened next. In one, Maria had just rode past the boulder when Francisco heard the crack of a gunshot. He saw his wife fall from the horse, shielding Geraldo in her arms before a small group of Apache ran out from behind the boulder. In another version, there are no gunshots, and Maria is rushed and dragged off the horses by two or three Apache women and maybe a man that we'll talk about later. In either case, the Apache present immediately drew knives and began stabbing her. At this moment, Francisco Fimbres had to make a decision, among the worst I can imagine. Several accounts say he had a gun, either a revolver or a rifle. Some say he was unarmed, but most do say that he was. When he sees his wife attacked, what should he have done? Should he have marched forward to try to save his wife and son? Or does he think of his daughter riding right there in his lap and retreat in order to ensure her safety? Francisco retreated. He gets his daughter to safety, kind of. He dropped her off in a bush a ways down the trail before rounding up some local ranchers and heading back up the path. That's where he would find Maria's body and Geraldo missing. I've thought about this question a lot. Does retreating make Francisco a coward? Or did he make the best choice that he could? There's a comment section. What do you think? I don't know that I have the right answer, but I do know that I would hate to make the choice. Regardless, I would bet everything I have that his guilt over this decision played a role in the revenge he was about to bring to the Apache. As soon as he was able, Francisco organized a rescue trip into the Sierra Madre in order to get his son. But a local girl, an Apache who had been adopted into the village as a teenager named Lupe, advised them against it. She didn't believe that Francisco could find the Apache in the mountains. She felt that no matter what he did, they would see him coming. Francisco tried to recruit her as a guide, but she refused to go. The last time she was with the Apache taught her better. She was too frightened of what they would do to her if they found her again. She said that the Broncos were led by Apache Juan, the man who may have been present when Maria was murdered. She said that he was a bad and cruel man. The plan she suggested was heartbreaking to Francisco. She wanted him to let the Apache go. She believed, through her experience, that if the Apache learned they were being tracked, they would kill Geraldo to get any pursuers off their trail. But if they thought that they were in the clear, they would adopt him, as they did dozens of captives over the years. After a while, Geraldo would become one of them. They would become attached and develop an affection for him, and hopefully become unwilling to hurt him. Then, after a few years, a rescue could be attempted. 
Francisco didn't take the advice. He is a father, of course he didn't. Riddled with guilt, he was set on a plan of action. Over the course of the next two or three years, he organized over eight expeditions into the Sierra Madres to look for the Broncos. But, as Lupe predicted, he didn't find what he was looking for. Usually, he found nothing. Sometimes he found trails or empty camps, but no Apache. Francisco tried to advance his tactics. He would conceal the presence of his expedition with darkened clothes. They avoided fires so that they couldn't be located by light or smoke, and they moved as much as they could in silence as possible. But they still found nothing. Anyone who has read about the Apache isn't surprised by this. During the Apache Wars of the 1800s, the U.S. was firm in their stance that only an Apache could find Apache, and they employed hundreds of them as scouts as proof of that fact. These Broncos were the needle in the proverbial haystack that is the Sierra Madre. But experience is valuable, and Francisco wasn't about to give up. At the same time Fimbres is conducting his expeditions in Mexico, an American named Grenville Goodwin is conducting research that will turn into several books on the Western Apache. He was deeply interested, probably in a very romanticized sense, that there were wild Apache in the Sierra Madres. He would track newspaper articles reporting anything about them and gather as much information as he could from his contacts at reservations like San Carlos. He even went on two expeditions to Mexico in order to try to make contact. He failed, as most did at trying to find the Apache, but he kept journals of everything he learned that would later be published in a book called The Apache Diaries by his son. It's a great read. It does a lot to verify rumors around the story and answer bigger questions, like how the Apache were able to survive in the mountains from the 1880s on forward. First, the Apache were incredibly resourceful. They could hunt and forage for everything available in their environment, but they were not completely self-sufficient. They were not farmers, at least not at scale. They had to raid to supplement their needs. Most of the time, they wouldn't bother anyone. They were extremely cautious. Raids were small. They would take a cow or two from a farm here or there, rarely the same farm, at least not in a short time period. They knew to spread out what they took. Some of the farmers even claimed to know the Apache were doing it. They kind of viewed it as a tax. They knew if they went after them, they were never going to find the Apache. But if they tried, they would paint a rather large target on their back. They were a terrifying people to make an enemy out of. So no, let them take a cow here or there and they will simply return to the mountains. Some Broncos likely made visits occasionally to San Carlos or the Mescaleros Reservation. They would receive help from the Apache there. The Broncos were holdouts from the Indian Wars. The Apache there, although aging, likely knew who some of the Broncos were. There are enough sightings and accounts from people on reservation that make these visits almost certain. Lastly, sometimes they would simply walk into Mexican towns and trade. Many Apaches spoke Spanish, at least enough to get by. There are reports of Apache camps discovered that had Mexican clothes. Dressed that way, speaking Spanish, many could go easily unnoticed, especially as many of the Apache were of mixed heritage. Lupe said that Apache Juan would do this, walk through towns, completely unnoticed. By 1930, Fimbres' attempts to rescue his son had garnered some regional attention. The Mexican government was hesitant to provide any assistance, at least officially, but Fimbres was able to get some support from eager volunteers in the United States. The Douglas Daily Dispatch invited people to enlist, and pretty soon American volunteers outnumbered Mexican. Their enthusiasm didn't go unnoticed. Some applicants wrote in asking to be included. I am not going to take the time to read them out loud, but I have posted three here if you want to pause and check them out. The venture was sold as the last Apache hunt, and the volunteers reflected that sentiment. But before it could get underway, the Mexican government shut it down. They were getting a little nervous at the idea of having hundreds of American militants on their soil, many of them not hiding the fact that they were also interested in the rumors of gold, silver, and copper in those mountains. But even without his volunteers, Fimbres escalated his pursuit, and his efforts paid off. In 1931, this bombshell hit the front page of the Arizona Daily Star. Quote, Revengeful father returns with Indian scalps. End quote. In April 1930, after the punitive force of Americans was grounded by the government, Fimbres moved with 12 men from Nicorichico on horseback. They were following a new lead and scouring an area of the Sierra Madre they had never been to before. Broncos had recently ambushed a small group between the Corichico and Casas Grandes. 
A few days in, they spot sign of Apache and smoke from a campfire. They approach the area in silence and with the utmost caution. At first, they see just two Apache, women. The group took aim and fired at them, hitting one in the arm. She screams Nakaye, the Apache word for Mexicans. The other yells for help, and she calls Apache Juan by name. Before the women can get away, the posse fires a second volley and kills them both. The Mexicans see other Apache fleeing into the forest, but Apache Juan ran toward the group and began firing back, staying behind to defend his tribe, despite being drastically outnumbered. Fimbra's team was able to pin him down behind cover before one of the group flanked him. The initial shot injured him before the group moved in and finished what they started. In the silence after the fight, the Mexicans then inspected the camp. They took valuables like saddles and rifles, as well as Apache trinkets that they found as souvenirs. But before they left, they made two very serious mistakes. They scalped the dead and they left the bodies unburied and in the open. Fimbres hoped that by being so brazen, that maybe the Apache would fear him and they would free Geraldo to get them off their backs. But that's not what they do. And this is not that kind of story. The image published in the Arizona Daily Star is in essence a victory photo. Despite the warnings of Lupe, Fimbres thought this was the path to getting his son, fear and intimidation. The Mexican government took this tactic throughout the last century. But all of that history with the Apache should have told them that it wouldn't work. Failing to understand the Apache cost him everything. A couple days after the expedition that killed Apache Juan and the two women, two Mexican men riding horses in the area of the fight caught the smell of decay and investigated. The three Apache who were left out in the open had been carefully buried by their companions when they later returned. But next to their graves was another. Buried shallow and with his legs sticking out was the body of Geraldo. There were obvious signs of torture. He would have been about seven. Accounts from friends of Fimbres say that at this point he was a broken man. His primary motivation before was to get his son back. Now he only lived for revenge. Blood feuds dominate the story of Native American history, and this one is no different. A piece of tragic irony in this story is that from Fimbres' perspective, his mission came from wanting vengeance for his wife and to save his son. But that attack was likely not a random act of violence. Around 1915, 12 years before the attack on the Fimbres family, the Broncos had stolen some cattle and a group of ranchers, including Fimbres, caught up to them. In doing so, they capture a young Apache girl. She lived with the Fimbres family for a while before being baptized and adopted by another. She believed, since she was taken, that Nakori Chico was constantly being watched and that the Fimbres family was marked by Apache Juan and her mother. At one point, a few years after her capture, she asked to rejoin her people, and the community decided to let her. She went up into the mountains and found her family. But she was told that she was no longer welcome with the Apache, and that if she returned, that they would kill her. That little girl was Lupe. The same Lupe who had been giving Fimbres advice since the attack in 1927. She believed that the woman who pulled Maria off that horse was her mother, and that taking Geraldo was essentially an exchange, a child for a child. She also believed, from the descriptions given to her from Fimbres, that the Apache women killed in 1930 was her mother and her sister. The violence between the Broncos and the Fimbres family had been going on now for nearly two decades, but it wasn't over. In 1934, Grenville Goodwin estimated that there were around only 30 of these Broncos left. He made these estimates based on the amount of cattle taken on ranches in the area and what the Apache would need in food in order to sustain themselves. It's for sure not a perfect estimate, but it does give us a starting point. He wrote of the Broncos, quote, They are fighting a losing battle in Mexico, and it seems only a question of time till they will be exterminated, end quote. But news didn't travel especially fast to the United States. And by 1934, that may have already happened. Despite his attempts, Grenville Goodwin missed some news. He had issues with tuberculosis and was out of commission for large chunks of time in the 1930s. There is an incomplete record, and frankly at this point in the story I am not sure what is true and what is legend. 
Some of the conflicts appear to be reported twice by different people on different timelines with different details, but this is what can be put together. In the spring of 1933, several sources claim Fimbres led a group of ranchers on an expedition that killed two dozen Apache. But that fight mirrors one reported in 1932, in which far less Apache are killed. In both, three children are taken, each of them dying within a year. There was a report out of Tucson in September of 1934 that is eerily similar to one in 1935, in which a group including Fimbres ambush Apache coming down from cover in the mountains following a heavy snow. What does seem consistent is that in 1935, reports stopped. So, were all the Apache dead? I don't think so. In 1937, a Norwegian explorer, Helge Ingstad, led an expedition into the Sierra Madres in search of any remaining Apache. He didn't find them, leading many to assume they were all gone. But there is more to that story. First is that the expedition may have found more than was reported. Ingstad had two Apache guides. One of them, Yanoza, was a former warrior who had surrendered with Geronimo way back in 1886. At one point during the expedition, Ingstad separated from his guides for a few days. They never told him, but reported to people on reservation later that they didn't find any Apache, but they did find a camp with evidence of Apache there recently. Whether that is true or not, I have no idea. But a year later, in 1938, Grenville Goodwin was visiting the Mescaleros Reservation. There he was told by two separate people of wild Apache who had visited the year before. The witnesses said they spoke Spanish. And in the decades that follow, there are other rumors that are hard to ignore. There was a story of a woman in Colorado who said her parents were from a small settlement in the mountains west of Chihuahua City. They would tell stories of their village and say that everyone there was related. She said that when her children were little, her parents would speak to them in Apache. They left the village in the 1950s. An anthropologist named Tom Hinton met a man who spoke with four men describing themselves as Apache in 1948 in the area south of Nacori Chico. The people who live in this area are mostly mountain Pimas, Native Americans. Hinton was told the men were wearing buckskin clothing and moccasins and that they claimed to have been descended from the Chiricahua. It's not unlikely that a small number who survived moved to different locations or assimilated themselves into small Mexican towns or communities. But a more romanticized view is that maybe a small population still lives out there. The region is unbelievably rural, the land is there, and to this day every so often someone reports having seen them. It's not likely, but I know if I ever find myself in the Sierra Madre, the most terrifying thing I can imagine is getting the feeling of being watched, or hearing sounds I can't quite explain. Thanks for watching the video. I hope that you enjoyed it and you come back to check out some of the other ones on the channel. If you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future videos, please send them in, and we'll hopefully get to all those.